So it'll be really helpful. I really appreciate it. And uh, anyway, I'm Doug Russell, the executive secretary for UNALS. Thanks. All right, Jonathan. Hi, I'm John Gutop. I teach maritime law at Roger Williams University School of Law in Rhode Island. I'm the UNAL's risk manager. Okay. Uh, all right, I'm probably gonna miss people because the names keep jumping around. Uh, Brandy. I just buried my mute button. Hi, I'm Brandy Murphy, and I'm the uh, technical services manager in the UNALS office. Good to see you, everybody. Eric, Eric Buck. Hey, good morning. Uh, this is Eric Buck. I'm the acting Marine Superintendent at Scripps. Uh, Stuart, young husband. Stuart, you're still on mute. Okay, that's better. Okay, so hi everybody. Um, my name's Stuart Young, husband. Um, I work for the National Oceanography Centre in um, Southampton in the UK, um, and look after the research ships uh, James Cook and Discovery. Uh, and my particular strength is in uh, compliance. Thank you, uh, Alice. Hi, I'm Alice Doyle, and I am also with the UNOL's office. Amanda Williams. Good afternoon, Amanda Williams with the US Department of State Office of Ocean and Polar Affairs and the Maritime Geographer, and I serve on the Marine Scientific Research Team and will be presenting to you today. Anita. Hey, good morning, everyone. Anita Lopez, Director of Research Vessel Operations, University of Hawaii. Ash. Hi, I'm Ash Hayden. I'm the operations manager. We've got Tom Glennon, the director. Uh, my microphone's not working at my desk, so. <laughs> All right, Tom, we'll count you checked in already. Blake. Yep, hi, I'm uh, Blake Powell with JMS Naval Architects. Um, and uh, involved with the NSF ship inspection program. Brian? I'm Brian Guest. I'm with the Woodsole Oceanographic Institution and manager of the UNOL's East Coast Winch Pool. Bridget. Hi, good morning. I'm Bridget Harold Donze, and I'm with the UNOL's office as well. All right, I have someone logged in as just the name Brian, Brian with a Y. Hi, it's Beth Ryan. I'm with uh, the Wichita Oceanographic Institution, a uh, personnel manager. Uh, David Bowman. Uh, yes, hello, my name is David Bowman. I operate the research vessels at Stony Brook University in New York. Dennis. Thank you, uh, Doug. Dennis Hansel here, University of Miami, uh, UNOLS chair. Don. I'm Don Kachar, University of Miami, Marine Operations Manager. Emma. Hi, this is Emma Tully, also part of um, State Department's MSR team, going to be presenting today. Thank you. Eric Benway. Hi, Eric Benway, Woodsall Oceanographic Port Captain. Finn? Hello, um, this is Finn Moore. I'm a sales manager with McGregor. We supply overboard handling systems for the UNOLS fleet and research vessels uh, globally. Gabby. Hi, everyone. I'm Gabby David. I'm at the U.S. Department of State in the Office of Ocean and Polar Affairs. Um, I'm on the Marine Science team and will be presenting today. Thanks. Holly? Hi there. I'm Holly Antonez. I'm with Lidos, and I am the project manager for the Antarctic Research Vessel. Ian? My name is Ian. I work with Woods Hole Oceanographic as an administrator and ship operations. James Allen. 
Uh, yeah, Jamie Allen, uh, Ocean Drilling Program, National Science Foundation. Jim Hollick. Uh, Jim Hollick, NSF, uh, Technical Services, Instrumentation, and SSSC. Admiral Garrett. Uh, Jeff Garrett, I'm uh, chair of the RVOC Safety Committee. All right. Joe. I'm Joe Malbrew, uh, Marine Superintendent at Louisiana's University's Marine Consortium. All right, John. John Bickey. Thanks, Doug. I'm John Bickey. I'm the Marine Superintendent <clears throat> at uh, Skidaway Institute of Oceanography and manage the research vessel Savannah. John Meyer. Hi, everybody. I'm John Meyer from Scripps, uh, manage the High Seas Net project, and I'll be presenting today about your internet. John Swallow. Hello, everybody. Uh, John Swallow, Marine um, Superintendent at the uh, University of Delaware, RV Hugh R. Sharp. Okay, Jonathan Goodoff. I thought I already introduced myself, but again, I'm the UNOS risk manager and I'm happy to be here. Thank you for doing it twice. Uh, Kaya. Everyone, I'm Kaya Johnson. I'm the OSU of Marine Superintendent and uh, West Coast Van Pool Manager. Lee Ellett. Hi. I'm Lee Ellett, uh, Manager of Shipboard Technical Support here at Scripps, uh, involved in the High Seas Net and the CIWG updates. And we have Skipper from the Neil Armstrong on board. Good afternoon. It's uh, Mike Singleton, the Relief Master of the Neil Armstrong. Megan. Megan Corcoran, Port Captain for the University of Washington. Murray. Murray Stein. I went through that whole thing and I was muted. My name is Murray Stein. I'm interim Marine Superintendent at Bermuda Institute of Ocean Sciences. We manage the Atlantic Explorer. Claire. Hello, everyone. Uh, Commander Claire Sorry Marston. I uh, work for NOAA um, Headquarters Operations for the um, Admiral Staff as his Marine Advisor. Rick? I'm Rick Trask. <clears throat> I manage the NSF um, wire pool. That's what it is. Robert Camphouse. <clears throat> Robert Camphouse, Manager of Marine Operations, University of Washington School of Ocean Arts. Rob Sparrick. Uh, good morning, Rob Sparrick, Program Manager, uh, Office of Naval Research for Research Facilities. Rose? Rose Dufour, Ship Operations Program Manager at NSF. Ross? I'm Ross Hine, the Antarctic Support Contract, Science Mission Coordinator for the Antarctic Research Vessel Project. Sarah Fuller? Sarah Fuller, Operations Manager, Hui SSG. Uh, Sean Higgins. Sean Higgins, uh, Director of Marine Operations uh, for the Marcus Langseth, uh, LDEO, Columbia University. Stuart. As Stuart Lamberton, uh, prior member, uh, Director of Marine Operations at VIMS and um, member of the Safety Committee. Tim Toomey. Hey, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, Tim Toomey, Wood Soil Oceanographic, Director, Director of Ship Operations, RV Atlantis, RV Neil Armstrong. And uh, I'm looking out at the RV Endeavor from URI right now. I've talked to Tom already. Trevor. I'm Trevor Young. I'm a Marine Technician with University of Hawaii. All right, looks like uh, the new guy in Hawaii, Matt, you logged in as your title. 
uh, Andy Knopper, um, Andy, uh, the Marine Superintendent, uh, University of Hawaii. This is why we do introductions. <laughs> I think that's everybody. Is there anybody I missed? Uh, Mike Prince, uh, Antarctic Research Vessel Project Manager, Nicholas Science Foundation. I think Bruce Applegate. Yeah, good morning, Bruce Applegate, Associate Director, Scripps Institution of Oceanography. I think you got everybody then, uh, Doug, good job, <laughs> a lot. Okay, uh, introductions. Um, next item on the agenda is a UNOLS update. Mr. Russell, you're up. Okay, I will share my screen, uh, very simple. <clears throat> presentation. Um, well, good morning, everybody. Welcome. It's good to see everybody again. Um, it's been uh, it's been a long time since we've had actually had a RVOC meeting. Uh, and as Doug alluded to, hopefully we'll get back to in person next year uh, for our to, for our get together. I just want to give you a quick summary update: what's been happening in the UNOS front and uh, many different areas. Uh, last year, thanks to all your great work and uh, the uh, unwavering support of the funding agencies, uh, completed well over three thousand days of shipboard science in 2021, despite the pandemic. So, as hats off to everybody for all their hard work, uh, including crews, uh, marine operations, marine technicians, and the science parties for all being adaptable, flexible, creative, and everything else to make it work. We're still catching up in 2022 on cruises that were deferred due to COVID-19, and the impacts are continually on into 2023 as we look, we're working on the scheduling issues. Uh, big, a big accomplishment in 2022, um, the the academic research fleet was completely scheduled in marine facilities planning. I know you're kind of tired of hearing about MFP. Uh, it's been coming for quite a while, but uh, through great work of all the operators, uh, all the schedule, and Alice uh, Doyle in particular for all her work with the, the developer as the project manager, we were able to get everybody scheduled in MFP and people are getting pretty, pretty darn good at using it now for the scheduling piece. And the scientists are doing a great job with requesting time on ships through it. Um, 2023 ship scheduling process has been proceeding along, particularly with the, the big ships, uh, the globals, the ocean class, and the intermediates. Uh, we kick off the smaller vessels next week with a meeting uh, since we wait later in the year because they have, theirs is more of a dynamic uh, scheduling uh, process. And we wait till that more uh, proposals are funded at the agencies before we start them in a, into the process. So that's good news. Um, with MFP now, we are in the process of rolling out the cruise planning module. Alice has been working very closely with the operators, trying to get that, that module so it's very helpful to all the operators. As part of that, the post-cruise assessment reporting process will also come out. Uh, right now, it's a very simplified process once you get into um, MFP. So I won't duplicate what a lot of you have been dealing with in meetings directly with uh, UNOL's office, particularly with Alice. Uh, UNOL's meetings, um, as Doug already alluded to, we've been doing, we've been moving along virtually. We're gonna start shifting back to in-person meetings, given uh, how the track line is going for uh, the pandemic. Uh, next month, there's gonna be a new users program for associated with the Deep Submergence uh, Committee in Woods Hole. Uh, we are going to do the annual council and pick meetings in Alexandria near uh, National Science Foundation uh, next fall in November, the week before Thanksgiving. Uh, and we also hope to have a council and fleet improvement committee meeting uh, this summer. Uh, we're looking to try to do it down in the New Orleans area so we can get a lot of people down to see the RCRVs that are under construction. Uh, and other committee meetings will follow from there, score of, um, the uh, <clears throat> Marine Seismic Research Committee, as well as um, DESK, as we already talked a little bit about. So a lot more to come down the road on all this, AICC for the Arctic icebreaker part of the, uh, the operation. So it's good to see us starting to return to in-person meetings. Uh, COVID-19 guidance, as we all know, it's been 
Uh, a lot of things are happening fast. I actually have a phone call later today uh, with GW to get their latest recommendations for updating our guidance. Uh, many thanks to all of you for working with it, being very, uh, doing a great job in all your risk assessments and op operating your vessels very smartly. We've had very few loss of, uh, a very little loss of time at sea due to COVID-19, thanks to all the great work you're doing and managing the program. I know it's, we all know it's been a really hard grind. Everybody, the crews are tired, you're tired, uh, but your efforts have really paid off and a lot of science has gotten done. Uh, sailors have been employed, marine technicians have been employed, and uh, we keep delivering great science. So thanks to all of you for your hard work. And again, like I talked about earlier, the great support of NSF and ONR to make it happen as they've continually funded all your operations. Um, the research vessel safety standards, they were updated in, in, in huge part due to uh, Rear Admiral Garrett's uh, great work on it. We published it online back in November. Uh, we've been slow, but we now have printed versions of them and they're gonna be distributed to you shortly based on uh, when we surveyed you quite a while ago, how many copies you'd want. So you look forward to seeing those soon. Uh, I know Jeff's already working on working with the safety committee on an, an update to Appendix A. So we the hard copies we'll be sending out to you can be updated with inserting pages. So it's a living document. So more to come on it, but at least it's been updated. Uh, and I know a lot of you are already working with it, and we've got a lot of good questions about it. So thank you for your feedback. Uh, the council is focusing a lot on uh, diversity, equity, inclusion, and justice issues, uh, especially through the hard work of the uh, Mayor's committee, uh, more to come on that in the future, but uh, under the leadership of Dennis Hansel, the UNOS chair, uh, the council's taken some good hard looks at a lot of these issues and how it affects uh, operations across the fleet. Um, we've kicked off a crewing tiger team effort uh, with a lot of support from the federal agencies. Uh, great participation, we have ship captains, we have ship marine operations staff, we have HR help, uh, including Beth Ryan from HUI. Uh, we've had five meetings to date. Our most recent one was a presentation to uh, NSF and ONR. I'll talk more about it later on, but uh, that is kicked off and running. Uh, and we appreciate everybody's contributions while everybody's so busy doing other things. And it's a, it's a tough issue everybody's dealing with. And finally, uh, the UNOL's office at UW, we are finished, we just finishing it, we're in the process of finishing up year three of our initial five year cooperative agreement. Um, and then we'll see later on about if our, we're renewed for a second five years, but it's moving along. The agencies have been amazing in supporting us and we really appreciate um, how much they, they just stood up and, and roll along with us and allowing us to do all these things for you. And that's pretty much it for my update. Um, I'll stop sharing my screen. Any questions from anybody about the UNOLs in, in general? Okay, I guess I've dazzled you with brilliance. So uh, with that, Doug? All right, I will move on to the agenda uh, and to agency updates. Up first, Rose with NSF. Okay, I am going to share my screen. I just have a five. Oh, hang slide. on, I bet I didn't. I was gonna ask you. you. Yep, you should be good to go. Okay, um, do you guys see my screen? Yes. yes. Okay. Okay, I have a beautiful picture of the Sukuliak because um, Doug was able to send me some high resolution pictures. So that's a reminder to you guys that if you have some good footage, send it along and I will use it in my background. I'll use it for all kinds of presentations and in, in-house. So um, anyway. I like this picture. Just a quick rundown of where we are at NSF. Right now, I'm in the middle of annual report negotiations. A few operators have been fully funded. Thank you for getting your reports in. Um, so since they were the head of the line, they ended up getting their full allocation for the year. But NSF and GEO has not provided IPS with our full allocation. So, um, as I go along, I'll have to provide incremental funding, and when the um, the allocation is in my account, then I can finish. Whoops, I don't know what happened there. 
sorry. Um, okay, uh, calendar year 2023 is the start of the new five-year cooperative agreement. So that means this fall, your sponsored research offices will be asked to negotiate new terms and conditions. So be thinking about the items that you want to include in the new terms and conditions. Things that will help you, this is a cooperative agreement, so it's cooperation on both sides. Um, next year, we had a budget rollout for the 2023 budget, and I guess they got tired of hearing me whine so much. I must have it on some kind of automatic, sorry about this, um, about all my, my uh, funding issues. So I, the ARF was shown with a 19% increase for 2023. It's very early in the budget process. It has to go to the president's budget and has to go to Congress and, and things go back and forth, but it was good to see at least that the 19% was in there. Um, a divestment process is underway for Oceanus. And at the same time, I took advantage of of um, going through the renewal process for, for UAF, for Sequoiaq, and those were successful and are moving forward. Um, the crewing issues, I think, is probably the biggest challenge we have in the academic research fleet, and I have elevated that to the highest levels within NSF and provided all kinds of spreadsheets that indicate what it could potentially cost us as, in terms of increasing day rates to support um, pay equity and I, I just want to let everyone know that I'm very supportive of that kind of initiative. There was also some recommendations about adding extra port days. Certainly we're open to that. So um, some of these recommendations that are coming to the agencies, we're trying to figure out how we can support. Some are just done up, dead on arrival, like we're not gonna have swim calls and we're not gonna have alcohol in the ship and things like that. But there are some things that we can do that require money and we're open to that. Um, I'm glad to see State Department is on the call and they can tell us more about the Bahamas. But right now from the NSF position, we have an embargo on any work in the Bahamas. And then just to remind everyone on the NSF branding guidance, here's the website. If you need any um, examples on what we would, like to see in your branding efforts to, to display NSF, you can find it there on that website. Before I go to the next slide, does anyone have any questions? No? Okay. I didn't break this down by each class of ship. I just took all the ships in the academic research fleet and just from kind of demonstrating where our um, different day rate breakdowns are, as you can see, crew and fuel take more than 50% of the day rate um, and fuel is gonna be more and crew is gonna be more. So hopefully my pie will be bigger, but if not, then we'll have to support less science because there's not an increase in the, the dollars. It's gotta come out of somewhere. Um, this is just an example of how I went through and kind of extrapolated that we would might have a potential of $3 million over um, overage for fuel this year based on either a 10%, 20% or 30% increase. So I think my $3 million request made it into this year's um, budget considerations. So I'm hoping, fingers crossed, I see an extra $3 million, but that's to be determined. All of you probably saw this. I sent it out last week, but um, NSF has launched a, um, a new notice in the federal registry to change the PAPG guide. And this is specifically for safe and inclusive field vessel and aircraft research. Um, and there's going to be a requirement for proposals that include uh, field work. Right. That's why I need to find out. But right. you have a full time job too. So yeah. someone needs to mute themselves. Sorry. Need to figure that out with him. Um, Mark Ben Wise. Can you mute? Well, I'm committing is because I don't want to say I'll be on the. Okay, so anyway, I encourage people to look at that. There's only a, a 60 day comment period. 
And um, I think the, uh, the seagoing scientists are gonna rely on our already established protocols um, on the ships as part of their uh, field plan. And finally, I just wanna echo what Doug said. Thank you so much. I know it's been a very difficult past two years and um, thank you for all your hard work. Any questions? Okay, fair enough. Thank you, Rose. Uh, next up, uh, Rob Sparrick, ONR. Uh, good morning. Did you get a chance to get my slides and are you able to push? Uh, Bob, I did not get them, so I don't want you to send them right before this, but so can you share and do it? I cannot. I'm on a cell phone. All right, let me look at my email and see if I can find them then. All right, with that, I will continue to uh, uh, pontificate while I have some time while Doug pulls this up. Uh, I have a brief that is going to show how things were from the RCOV brief in uh, nine years ago, and that uh, things at ONR have been relatively unchanged in that nine year period, uh, or changed in at least an interesting way. Uh, I'd like to thank uh, NSF, uh, particularly for getting us through the fiscal challenges uh, imposed by. Uh, COVID. Uh, ONR would not have been able to uh, continue to fund the ships through that uh, particular crisis. Uh, so that was good that the interagency was able to uh, continue to fund to keep the ships going. Uh, with that said, my nine-year priority from now is uh, trying to get the next generation of research vessels. So I will uh, go through this pretty quickly, apologize in advance, because uh, I know some of you were here in 2013 and have already seen these slides. So this is what ONR's um, kind of template of what we were looked like back in 2013 with the uh, 2013 logo. Next slide, please. And this is what we show today with uh, really the only significant change is uh, trying to dispose of flip. Next slide, please. So again, uh, a retrospective brief, uh, next slide. So uh, nine years ago, we were talking about retiring the NOR and the Melville. Those two ships uh, were foreign military sales or transfers and uh, continue to operate this day well over 50 years of service. Uh, I don't know if the uh, two operators who, um, or the previous operators still have any contact with the uh, current operators of the NOR and Melville, but I know they're still running around in the ocean doing things. Next slide, please. So back in 2013, this is kind of how we had our spread of uh, ONR days. 2013 in red uh, shows what we had in 2022. Uh, as you can see, more or less pretty stable, um, a slight decrease, but uh, with the addition of some funds to uh, both the Coast Guard Cutter Healy, which is not shown, and some foreign ships, which we needed to do multi-ship ops, uh, including the uh, NATO ship uh, Alliance. Uh, we're pretty stable on the number of days from nine years ago. Next slide, please. Uh, back in 2013, we said we wanted to do things that involved uh, multi-ship efforts. We wanted to go to the South China Sea. We wanted to operate in the Bay of Bengal. We wanted to get on Arctic uh, and continue to do Arctic research. And at some point we wanted to uh, demonstrate the capability of UAVs. Next slide, please. And in 2022, we're still doing multi-ship efforts like with the New England Sea Mounts. We're still interested in going back to the South China Sea and the Bay of Bengal. We do uh, fund Arctic research, uh, both with the help of Sekuliak and uh, Healy, uh, although we haven't demonstrated uh, UAV capabilities. Next slide, please. Uh, back in 2013, in-serve inspections were every five years. Uh, the only thing that's changed there is uh, they're now at every three years. Uh, that was a result of Congress. It had more so to do with the Navy, uh, particularly the collisions uh, in the Western Pacific that resulted in the death of uh, a number of sailors. Uh, so that made the Congress want to increase uh, material inspections. Uh, on that note, Atlantis did particularly well on their last in-serve inspection, uh, kind of a short notice inspection. 
Um, so that's very impressive. Those results actually get passed to Congress. It's uh, something that I think the in-serve inspections themselves and the results will be important for being able to get the next generation of oceanographic research ships demonstrating that the UNOLS operators um, have excellent material condition and the investment that Congress is making in these ships are worthwhile. Uh, Rose talked about the manpower supports. I just wanted to highlight two points. Uh, I've reviewed your COIs, at least for the ships that have COIs, made some suggestions. Uh, I guess they're up to you to decide, uh, but having more flexible COI requirements, I think will make it easier to ship manpower uh, when we're in short term. Uh, the only other place I can really help as a federal agency with uh, manpower directly is with the strategic sea lift officers. Uh, back in 2013, they were called the Merchant Marine uh, Naval Reserves. Some of you may know them affectionately by their nickname, the Sea Chickens, which was the big uh, pin that they wore. You have many of you, many of the uh, US operators have these uh, personnel in their full time positions who are also naval reservists. So you're familiar with these people. Uh, for University of Washington, I have an ONR reservist who's going to work direct support on the shore side. I'm working with Bruce Applegate to try to get temporary assignments at sea. I've also hired a strategic sea lift officer as contractor support. Uh, she was a former commanding officer of a Navy oceanographic survey ship. So uh, this is really kind of my only contribution I can provide, I think, to the manpower issues. Uh, the community is almost 2,000 strong of unlimited licensed personnel uh, who are who have a need to sail and have a need to um, continue to operate the U.S. fleet should the president so declare. Uh, if you have any of these people in your crew, uh, suggest you chat with them and kind of understand the program more. Uh, if you're a prior officer yourself, um, you know, advocate with your fellow Marine soups on what these people bring. Next slide, please. All right, uh, back in 2013, we we're talking about what options we wanted to do for the midlife. Um, midlife's, we've uh, had many meetings on this and we pulled it off, uh, only a few you know, million over budget, but uh, we were able to accomplish it. And uh, again, thanks to uh, the operators for uh, wonderful midlife refits. Next slide, please. Uh, back in 2013, we were talking about some of the problems with the ships with Z drives and boat davits and um, electronic charting systems. So those are some of the things we were talking about in 2013. Some of you are probably still around and remember them. Next slide, please. Uh, let's see, go one more now. I think you might've gone to, oh yeah, there you go, thanks. Uh, so. Yeah, so Atlantis is working on uh, getting a new rescue boat. We still need to replace cranes. Uh, and the one on Kila Moana, we were out of funds to do anything about it. So we actually had to derate the crane to keep it operational. Uh, we never really hired um, a subcontractor after the thrust uh, improvement study, um, but we continue to look at how we're overhauling the uh, Z drives. Uh, I know the operators of the, the, the Z drives continue to uh, exchange ideas on how to best uh, support that program. And of course, we're continuing with the upgrades. Uh, recently funded a new EM-124 for Thompson, so she'll have a full deep water capability. And, um, you know, more of the same. Next slide, please. I think that's it. Oh, uh, the data slide. Maybe I had it out of order. Go up one. Oh. Yeah. Yep, that one. Can you see this? Yep, thanks. Um, in a lot of ways, I am trying to focus my peers that the research facilities is more than just the ships, that our end product is the data, and that there are opportunities to use that data uh, because we spend a lot of effort on collecting it and putting it in repositories and making it available. And so that the oceanographic research vessels uh, owned by ONR are supporting not only just the scientists who physically go aboard the ships and use them, but that the data is being made available to a wider 
range of uh, uh, public partners and federal users. Uh, so I'm trying to use this sort of uh, thought process in hopes to continue to be able to build the next generation of global ships. Um, with that, the only other comment I guess I have for the group is uh, we continue to have struggles with uh, our other interagency partner, the Coast Guard. Uh, it really seems confined to a single sector. Um, if that comes up, I'm, I'm able to have some discussions on that, but I, I think uh, everyone knows where I stand on that for now. Uh, I'll take any questions at this point. Thanks. Yeah, Murray Stein here. Um, you had mentioned review the COI. Uh, what exactly did you mean by that? Sure, I'll give you an example. Um, some of the ships have a requirement for a master, a chief mate, and two rated and two licensed officers. Uh, other ships have a requirement for uh, a first, a second, and a third. So if you're short a second um, for some reason and your COI said you needed two licensed, you could in the short term say, help, I am in a need of a second or a third because your COI was flexible enough to allow you to have two licensed. But if your COI said, I need a second and a third and your second is, you know, has some medical issue and can't sail, now you're running around trying to look for a second to make that short-term fill. Um, between the ONR ships and Sekuliak that I looked at, some ships have uh, two licensed, some ships have one, two, and three, some ships have a mix between engineering and deck. Uh, there are similar concepts with both uh, the uh, able-bodied seamen and the ordinary seamen, uh, where there are a 65% rule and a 50% rule, and if you need more information on that, I'm happy to point you into the CFR. So we're talking about renegotiating our COI with the Coast Guard. Uh, yes, that would be. Um, so, yes, I guess that's a short answer. Okay. I, I see it as a method of increasing your flexibility. Uh, there are some operators who don't want to change, and that's fine. Um, but when I see disparities between ships of the similar class and they have different COIs, I, I think just getting them all on the same baseline uh, so that they're similarly following the rules. But right now I see some operators who have COIs that are written that are more constraining than other operators of similar ships. Sure, yeah, I, I see that. Some of it I think we got grandfathered in. Some of it I think is new technology that allows us to sail with fewer people. But I noticed recently I was sort of in discussion with the Coast Guard uh, and they're tending, they have a set standard now based on their involvement with SOLAS IMO regulations. So they're kind of coming out with a new standard that I think they're going to insist that new ships be held to that standard. Anyway, thank you. No, that's good feedback. Any other questions for Rob? Okay. And Thanks Murray, I think the first ship that's gonna to try to um, renegotiate their COI is uh, University of um, Hawaii. Um, on their particular instances, they have all um, able-bodied seamen and no OSs. Oh, yeah, okay, yeah, right. okay. If you have no OSs, then how do you, how do you build a cadre of people, right? You have, you gotta sail with everybody with the highest levels yeah. and there's no easy way to transition to people uh, who are, you know, at the journeyman level. Yeah, I understand, yeah. Okay, I'd be interested to see how successful they are. Thanks. Thank All right. Thanks, Rob. All right. Moving on to, to Noah and Claire, you're up. Claire, do you want me to drive your slides or do you want to do it yourself? That'd be great, sir, if you wanted to drive them. There's only three. Two, okay. Really. <laughs> All right. I got it. All right. Thanks. Sure. 
So thanks for having me again. My name is, uh, oh, sorry, go ahead. No, I was just gonna say, can you see it okay? Yeah. Uh, so my name Great. is uh, uh, Claire Surrey Marston, and I, as I mentioned before, I work for um, NOAA, Office of Marine and Aviation Operations Headquarters. So I'm part of the um, Admiral's uh, Operations Team. We uh, are mainly responsible for just coordinating um, the general uh, flow of the, the fleet in in um, in correlation with the Marine Operations Group, um, who I many of you might may have met as well. But so I'm just representing them today, just kind of doing a brief overview of of NOAA and where we are for this fiscal year, and then just of course our partnership here with uh, with you know. So you can slide to the next one, sir. So we continue to appreciate um, our uh, relationship um, with this group. Um, that's a picture of the Sekuliak coming into our Marine Operations Center Pacific uh, in Newport, Oregon, just a few weeks ago. So um, anytime we can help each other out is um, very valuable to us. Um, we participate in many of the meetings as much as we can. Uh, we'll swap projects project ship time here. They're all been hard to come by, of course, during the, the COVID times. Um, but we're starting to, to look at that again as our schedule kind of shakes out. Um, and uh, again, all the lessons learned that we've shared uh, between our midlife repair planning, uh, the COVID response and staffing um, as part of the staffing Tiger team, anything that we can do to sort of help lay the groundwork because we've been dealing with staffing issues um, ourselves, which I'll go into a little bit more, but again, just appreciate the the um, collaboration and uh, hope to continue that for the foreseeable future. Next slide. So FY22, um, it's been a, a little bit of a challenge for us. We're certainly working through it um, for various reasons. Um, we have, you know, our, our general approach to our mission or just how we operate in Omeo is uh, people first, then metal, then mission. And so we, as you know, have uh, mentioned before, we've had some staffing um, challenges that have sort of uh, compounded during the coronavirus event. And so we launched a new wage mariner hiring profile that's been um, really helpful for us. We've actually had uh, quite a few people taking advantage of our hiring bonus. Um, which is a uh, requires a two year signing agreement um, in exchange for uh, uh, initial bonus coming in. That's been very helpful. Uh, it still isn't quite covering um, the number of folks that we have kind of leaving or retiring. Again, that's been compounded by schedules and, and COVID, uh, things of that nature. So we are uh, stemming the tide, but um, it continues to challenge us. Uh, we do have uh, new protocols in place, which um, I actually just sent to you, um, Doug, for dissemination as appropriate, but they are uh, updated as of just last week. Um, we are requiring all seagoing personnel uh, to have not only the vaccine, but one booster. And so that has allowed us to leverage that additional safety lever level um, to be able to uh, reduce the, the contact tracing restrictions that we had in place um, and also kind of uh, we were able to reduce to one type of testing, which is the rapid antigen test. We had been using um, both the, anti ant the rapid antigen test as well as the PCR um, and we're getting sort of residual positives from folks who had been tested positive uh, for for weeks or months ahead of time. Uh, and so that was uh, a good step in the direction to be able to operate because uh, we did have to cancel quite a few cruises this year just because we had one or two essential personnel, essential personnel either test positive or uh, were within a uh, close contact definition, which for us was a little bit uh, more stringent than the CDC. Um, we had a five day quarantine for any folks who were considered a close contact, um, which occasionally meant that the, many of the crew were unavailable for, for several days. Uh, moving on, so uh, for the ships, uh, we do have our uh, Class A, the, the Agor variant nav 
ships that are going to begin construction this summer. So that's exciting. The oceanographer and the discoverer. Um, class B, we did have a delay there. So class A was delayed um, for the same reason, I think, as, as uh, other ships. Um, they're in Houma, Louisiana, because of the hurricane, Hurricane Ida. So that was a six month delay for us, but we're getting back on track. Um, and Class B was slightly delayed because we had to work out some design issues, but that request for proposal will be out next month. Um, and so we're looking forward to that. And we're still on track for the Ron Brown Midlife Repair. Um, we'll have an award date here next month as well. Um, and we do, we did get specific funding in the, um, the actual FY22 budget uh, to address that. So unfortunately we didn't get all of the things we asked for or that we hoped we would get based on the president's budget for FY22. So that has led to uh, a budget shortfall when you include the rising cost of fuel, uh, the maintenance, um, labor costs and additional COVID costs that we were hoping we would be able to avoid, but uh, with the Omicron variant, we were not able to. So we did have 2,650 uh, 2, days at sea planned. Um, we've lost approximately 400 of those due to mechanical issues, but also COVID and staffing related issues there. Um, we are working internally to NOAA, with NOAA to try to figure out how we can mitigate uh, the budget shortfall and so we're sort of standing by from NOAA budget to hear about that, but I'm sure with the fuel costs and, and labor costs, everything, inflation, of course, going up, it's gonna affect 22 and 23 next year. So we'll keep the group updated um, when we know more. So we are out there working. Uh, this is a picture of uh, one of our P3s that uh, flew over NOAA ship Rainier. She's currently conducting a Joint Fisheries and National Ocean Service Project off of Guam, uh, diving operations and hydrography operations. So that was a, a cool event that happened last week where we were able to um, get a little bit of a, of a dual operational um, project going there with Sea and Sky. Uh, some other highlights, we have the Thomas Jefferson is en route to do some um, hydrographic work in the Great Lakes. So that's pretty exciting. That hasn't happened for us um, before. Um, it's been a long time since some of those areas have been charted. And uh, yeah, lots of other projects out there, fisheries and, um, and weather service related. So it's been a tough go for sure, but we're working through our challenges. And that's really it. That's all I have for, for the NOAA updates. Um, standing by for any questions. Thank you, Claire. Thank you, sir. Okay, hey, moving on to the next agency update, uh, Department of State. Amanda, will you be starting off? I will be, thank you. Um, and this is about the time of day my dog likes to bark. So <laughs> I'm actually expecting somebody to come to my door in a few minutes. So if that happens, I'll just mute for a quick second. Um, so we have three of us on the team today presenting. Uh, it's our general update that we do on marine scientific, scientific research diplomatic consent process. Um, Emma, if you wanna to go to the next slide, please. So today we have myself, Amanda Williams, I'm the Maritime Geographer in the Office of Ocean and Polar Affairs. We have Emma Tully, who is the one that works on reporting. You've probably heard from her a lot lately. And um, she also works on getting the diplomatic consent for foreign scientists conducting research in US water. So she works with our interagency quite a bit. And we also have Gabriella David, um, as you know, is Gabby, and she works on all of the US scientists doing research abroad. So you all have mostly worked with Gabby, I would say in this call. And um, she really holds down the fort for us on all of these cruises. Um, so th these, these two women are really, really spectacular to have on our team. Allison is actually on maternity leave. She just gave birth in February to a very healthy baby boy. So she'll be back soon. Um, she hasn't left our team. I know you probably have not heard from her recently, but she's still with us. <laughs> Next slide, please. So as a quick refresher, uh, we have a lot of material to cover. I'm not gonna read everything on all the slides because what Gabby and Emma have to say is a lot more important, but just as a quick refresher, uh, we go based on the law of the sea convention for 
uh, the Marine Scientific Research or MSR rules. So the various articles um, outlined here on the slides, and we'll, we'll hand over a copy of the slides to share, um, are what we go based on for coastal state jurisdiction for the territorial sea, the EEZ, um, and that the reason the State Department is the one running this process is that Article 250 says that communications concerning MSR projects shall be made through appropriate official channels, which we interpret as State Department and most other countries interpret as their Ministry of Foreign Affairs. Next slide, please. So as you know, MSR consent is complicated. Everybody has um, some extra questions they get in their apps. There's always some sort of a hiccup or hurdle. So we, we appreciate, first of all, all your patience through this bureaucratic and um, diplomatic process. It's, it's a lot of work, but it is necessary. So optics, as you know, big ship coming in someone's water, what are they doing? It, it could be anything from a tall ship like the Sea Education Association or any of the various ships that you all work on. So the optics and having the right information conveyed is super important. Uh, geopolitics, unfortunately, do come into play. Uh, as much as we want science to be the most important thing, sometimes there are geopolitical issues that come up, especially with maritime boundary disputes. And so there's a reason we ask you not to include any maritime limits or boundaries on your maps. Uh, things are always evolving. We can't rely solely on past practice. As you know, there's always new forms or relationships change. Um, so just be patient with us as the situations evolve and it may not be the same as it was when you applied for the same research last year. Um, obviously consent is cumbersome, like I've already said, and it's never guaranteed. We do everything we possibly can. I mean, we, we check email all day long and we're constantly um, trying to reply uh, to, to everything. And so we've never forget about you and we're always trying to work behind the scenes. But if you don't hear from us, of course, uh, pick up the phone and give us a call. Um, so for all these reasons, we're involved. Um, so next slide, please. I don't believe this uh, group has heard about our presidential proclamation update. I know we uh, presented it to UNALS last year, uh, but not to RBOC. So in September of 2020, there was a presidential proclamation that we were able to get passed and it only applies to foreign scientists wishing to conduct MSR in US waters. So not really applicable to this group, but it's important to know that now advanced consent is in all instances is required. And so we were just bringing ourselves up to be consistent with international law. So in 83 or 84, when President Reagan had wanted MSR to be free and open, he had hoped other countries would follow suit and nobody did. And so for 30 years or more, uh, the US is the only one that has not required uh, consent in our EEZ. So this gives us a lot more visibility on who's in our waters, um, and asking those questions of what are you doing? Are you doing marine scientific research? If so, you need to go through all these steps. And so um, hopefully we'll be uh, getting all the data and reports that we are really owed. Um, but the consent was always required on the, um, in the territorial sea. So this just applies to the EEZ and the continental shelf. Next slide, please. So finally, we have our new RATS portal. RATS is the research application tracking system. So this is extremely exciting for us because we've talked about it for five years and it finally rolled out March 1st. And I know it's not the most um, exciting thing for everybody on this call because you have to learn a new technology and a new system. And, and that can be very frustrating, especially if it is different than the old system. Um, but it's, it's really cool because it was designed on a Microsoft O365, Office 365 cloud platform, um, and it has some new features. So you can request your own account now. Um, you don't have to rely on us to, to um, enter all your information into the account. So that's a little bit of a time saver. Uh, there's extra security, such as multi-factor authentication. There are automatic task reminders, and there's better search capabilities. So it is the same system with some enhancements, um, but the reason this had to happen is because the, the servers and the technology that the old system was built on was not, um, it was no longer able to be patched or brought up to date. So it was going to become a security risk if we did not update it. So um, we did hold some trainings, but of course we know that doesn't work with everybody's schedule. So if you'd like a one-on-one -on -one or something, please don't hesitate to um, reach out to us at our marine science at state.gov distro. And that's the new website, ratsportal.state.gov. It was previously just rats.state.gov. 
So we're very excited about it. And I know um, there's the steep learning curve, but thanks for your patience on that. Next slide. At this point, I'll turn it over to Gabby. Thank you. Hi everyone, um, Gabby here to talk about the US scientists doing research in foreign waters. Um, next slide, please. Just as a quick refresher on the process. Um, so first, the chief scientist and a platform coordinator or operator um, has an account created for them in RATS and they work together to complete an application. Once the application is completed, we do our review and we check it amongst all the requirements of the coastal states. Um, and then we process it to our embassy officers, our US embassy in the coastal state that we are requesting to do research in. Um, they do their review, they draft a dip note, and then they submit the whole package to the Ministry of Foreign Affairs in that coastal state. Um, that is when our timelines start. So I know um, if you look at our website, it says, oh, these applications must be done six months in advance. That does not mean submitted to State Department in six months in advance. It means give us a couple weeks to review it and get it to the MFA six months in advance. Um, so once the MFA does their review, it takes about uh, the six or seven months, whatever the coastal state requirement is, and then consent is hopefully issued. Um, and then about three months after the expedition is complete, the preliminary report is due and then the final report is due. Um, next slide, please. Emma Tully uh, grabbed this great map for us to highlight all of the regions that we've received applications for in 2021. Um, before COVID, we typically processed around 300 to 400 applications a year. Um, our numbers have uh, drastically went down. We did see less canceled applications this year than 2020 um, when COVID was really ramping up. So we're glad to be able to process some of these for you all. Um, next slide, please. And then I'm just going to go over some of our trends and challenges. Um, getting these applications in in advance is, is a huge thing. A lot of coastal states are cracking down on the timeline. We've also seen evolving requirements um, due to COVID and many other uh, things coming on in the ocean world of, of these requirements are ever changing and there's also no uniform system. So we use the research application tracking system to manage these applications, but each country is entitled to process these however they feel necessary. Um, we did want to highlight some of the countries below that are really, really cracking down on late reports. So we have seen an increase um, in coastal states withholding or delaying consent because of outstanding reports. And this could be towards the scientists, towards the vessel, towards the organization. Um, whoever has the outstanding report, they are now asking, oh, before we issue consent, where is this report from 2012? So even though you know you, most of our scientists are like, oh, this research is so old, who cares? Um, the coastal states do, <laughs> and your colleagues are paying for it. Uh, so that's why we are really cracking down on reports. Um, and then COVID, of course, um, as you all know, has, has drastically changed things also. Um, next slide, please. So the timing of the requirement changes. Um, as, I, as I said before, coastal states can process these applications however they want to. So when they change these requirements, it can sometimes cause scientists to rush to fulfill requirements to try to get consent. So that's why we urge everyone to get these applications in as early as possible so we can kind of troubleshoot for things like this to come up. Um, there was an increase in observers before observer requests before COVID. Um, so now we have to factor in the timing for quarantine, the timing for insurance documents, um, all these other forms that uh, are going to come with observers still being want to participate in these cruises. Um, and if, if you could just let us know what the, the COVID protocols are for your organization when you're submitting these apps anywhere, just so if the coastal state does want to have a participant on board, we can give them a heads up. Next slide, please. And we do have a marine science guidance page where we try to keep all of the most updated information about the coastal states and their requirements. 
the Bahamas, um, that our updates are not on the website yet because we're still trying to figure them out. Um, sorry, Rose. I wish we had more of an update, but the only update I have is that we are still in discussions um, with the Bahamas, with our embassy, with our legal office. Um, we're just constantly trying to get updates for you all. So um, hopefully you'll hear something from us soon. Um, but just reach out to us if you are planning on going to the Bahamas anytime soon. Um, Canada is also uh, becoming very firm on their application submission deadline. So please keep that in mind. It's still complicated in Cuba. It's been complicated in Cuba. Um, let us know if you plan to do any research in Cuba anytime soon. Uh, next slide, please. France is cracking down on their reports. Um, they are one of the ones that have been pushing back along with the BVI. Um, if you do have outstanding reports and you're requesting consent. So please keep that in mind. Mexico um, has been extremely hard to get consent from Mexico in the past year. We were recently notified that a new office is reviewing these applications now. So hopefully in the future, um, we will see uh, an easier process with Mexico, but, but it has been a struggle. The Philippines will absolutely not accept any late applications, even if you're collaborating with a Filipino scientist or um, whatever the situation is, they are not accepting late applications at all. Um, next slide, please. Argentina has been very vocal about wanting to collaborate with US scientists. So um, if you're planning to do work in Argentina, please let us know so we can try to make those connections. Um, CareBoss has some new fees. Sorry, St. Kitts is up there twice. <laughs> um, and Japan has been really, really strict um, on their requirements. Now, if, if anyone has gone to Japan recently, you know that they are requiring like daily updates. Um, it is literally nonstop communication, the whole review process and the whole cruise. So prepare for that. And all UK territories now have a very firm deadline and they're asking for some reports and things like that. So keep that in mind if you're going to any of the UK territories. Um, next slide, please. And I will turn it over to Emma Tully so she can talk about reports. Thank you guys. Hi everyone, um, you're probably familiar with my name in your inboxes asking about outstanding reports. Um, just want to start off on a positive note. Thanks to everyone who has been handing in your reports. We've really seen um, a really large uh, kind of wave of reports coming in um, the past couple of months, and that's been fantastic. Um, there are still outstanding numbers, obviously. Um, so I would encourage everyone to log into RATS portal, check out your task screen, make sure you don't have any outstanding reports tasks. And if you do, please work on getting those fulfilled because like Gabby said, um, coastal states do have the right to withhold consent on the basis of assigning reports um, for any US scientist. So even if you have all your boxes ticked, if your coworker doesn't, then that is an issue, unfortunately. Um, and one other important thing I did wanna note is even if you have say emailed your report and data to you, you know your Canadian colleagues, if it's not in RATS portal, us at state, we don't have visibility that these reporting requirements are fulfilled. So it's essential that you do submit these documents in RATS portal, just so we have a record of it. And then, um, you know, if the coastal state does, does ask, then we know for sure, oh, the, you know, these reports have been handed in. So that's one thing I really wanted to focus on. But we will move on um, to the next slide. And talk about who requests MSR consent. So for most coastal states, it's the flag state of the vessel. The US, we do it a little differently. Um, it's based on the nationality of the chief scientist. And then for Canada, it's owner of the data. So it's just important to know um, who expects what ahead of your cruise, just so there isn't any confusion down the line. And then this just shows um, helpful tips regarding how to submit these applications and to avoid any big roadblocks. Um, please submit as early as possible. We highly recommend seven months in advance before the start of the cruise. And another important note is to build in a time buffer. So when we get the either end of your intended research dates, that just kind of helps um, 
have a buffer in case something goes wrong. Um, once again, please don't include maritime boundaries on the cruise track. That's something that people tend to overlook. Um, and always feel free to email us on the status of your request. And once again, please make sure to submit um, the reports and data on time, just to make sure that those requirements are fulfilled. We have good you know, relations between countries on that regard. And once again, please submit as early as possible. So this slide is just general resources. Um, like Abby said, probably the most important one for you all is the documentation required by Coastal State. And we update that pretty regularly whenever we do get any sort of update from our embassies. So when you're, if you're in the planning stages, please make sure to check that page in case any additional requirements may have popped up. And that concludes our presentation for now. Um, if you have any questions after this entire um, you know, event, please feel to reach out to us at marine science at state.gov. But I'm gonna stop here and open up the floor for questions. I just wanna offer my thanks to Gabby and all. I spend a lot of time with them. Um, so we, we successfully got through Mexico where we'll be headed soon. I got a meeting with the agents here in about 50 minutes. Uh, but uh, no, I appreciate all the efforts of that whole group. I mean, it's been in, you know, it's a very nonlinear process, but I appreciate them picking up the phone and answering emails. Thanks, Sean. So glad that you got Mexico. Yeah, that means a lot, Sean. Thank you so much. Hi, Rob Spark with a question. Uh, so I understand that if you're a U.S. scientist, chief scientist, and you're on a foreign research vessel operating in either the U.S. EEZ or U.S. waters, an MSR is not required. If you could expand on that or clarify that. Sure. Yeah, that's that's exactly right. If if you're a U.S. citizen and you're doing research in U.S. waters, we typically don't care what vessel you're on. Um, sure, if the vessel has some sort of uh, nefarious background, our colleagues over in ONI, Office of Naval Intelligence, will give us a call and ask about it. Uh, but yeah, it's it's pretty open as long as the um, chief scientist is US doing research in US waters. All right, any other questions? Okay, thank you, Amanda, Gabby, Emma. Okay, moving on uh, to the facility updates. Uh, first up is the water pool. Rick. Okay, let's see, I'm gonna share my screen. That's okay. So can you see that? Yes. All right, very good. So uh, just update from the uh, wire pool. Going to uh, talk about briefly, talk about these five topics. No sense in reading them, but the first up is wire testing. And we continue uh, to do, to test new tension members, as well as those that are in use on research vessels, but occasionally, uh, we have to uh, do some additional testing. And one such case is where, uh, is the testing of some 9 16th wire when it's uh, being used on shivs that are uh, designed for 681 uh, power optic cable. And in particular, we were not able to, uh, to do this because of uh, our limitations here. But the, the interest is that uh, the safety committee has uh, received waiver requests to use 916 wire on those shivs. And uh, we wanted to collect some data which would either uh, confirm that it's not a problem or uh, identify a problem. So we went to TMT and they basically conducted several uh, breaking strength over rotating <clears throat> shiv tests. 
with uh, 916 wire on shivs that are grooved for 681. And the results of those tests kind of shown here, uh, in particular, I draw your attention to the, uh, these two tests. They were two series of tests. Uh, first, the straight line pull on the 916 wire that we sent them was 33,930 uh, 33, pounds. When we did the BSORS test, break the strength over rotating shiv on a 28 inch shiv that was grooved for 916 wire at 0 0.6, it broke at 28,370. Then we took that 28 inch shiv that, or another 28 inch shiv that was grooved for 6A1 and broke it and it broke at 27,170. So the difference between these two is approximately 4%, uh, but that seems to be well within the limits of some other testing, uh, break strength, breaking strength tests that uh, uh, TMT has done. So as Aaron says, it's a rather piddly uh, difference. We did a, uh, another series of tests with, or a single test, uh, sent a new sample of 916 wire. It, uh, a straight line pole was 33,570. This time we did it around a 48 inch shiv since many ships that are using uh, 6A1 are using it with 48 inch uh, diameter shivs. And that 48 inch shiv was grooved for 6A1. And as you can see, the, uh, the 916 wire on, that sh on those shivs broke 33.5, basically the same as the straight line pull. So with those results, uh, there's a possible revision being considered by the safety committee to um, table 8.8.4 8. in appendix A. And it is uh, under consideration for allowing 916 wire to be loaded to a factor of safety greater than or equal to 1.5 using shivs that are designed to be used with 681 uh, cable at a factor of safety between 2 and 2.5. So that is in the works, and I think uh, Doug will, uh, rather, uh, Jeff will be putting something together for review by the, uh, by the safety committee. Se second topic is with regard to the use of, uh, or operational guidelines for the use of synthetic rope. Uh, we had a situation where the, uh, the Armstrong, uh, needed to use 916 uh, plasma high code line, which we have in our inventory for a coring cruise in the Puerto Rico trench. And we did not have at the time any operational guideline. So we needed to put something together for this specific cruise uh, on, this spe on this specific ship. So we went to work with Cortland, worked with Aaron Davis out at Scripps and the safety committee focusing on the Armstrong's overboarding configuration. And that uh, included uh, the D over D that we were working with. So we were working with, in that case, 48 inch diameter shivs and 916 wire. So the D over D was quite large, was 85. The number of shivs around which the rope passes and we got the anticipated, uh, anticipated loading estimate from the OSU coring group to be around 15,000 pounds. And <clears throat> Corland's uh, cyclic bend over shiv test results were used to predict the number of double bend cycles uh, before failure. And so with the understanding that each double bend load cycle, uh, there is a small percentage of damage to the rope. So there's a limited number of uh, cycles that the rope can withstand. And with that, uh, knowing that, we were able to um, establish a factor of safety, which was considerably less than what we might normally uh, see. Uh, many manufacturers recommend factors of safety of five or higher. And uh, in this case, because we knew the specifics about the way it was gonna be used, and the number of shivs and D over D, like I mentioned, we were able to get the factor of safety down to 2.5, which, 
with an absolute lowest factor of safety of two. And this allowed that trip and the coring operation to take place um, uh, safely. And in fact, during the trip, they did not see any uh, pullout loads greater than uh, 15,000 pounds. So that was uh, uh, a good guideline in, that, in their case. Going forward with the future use of synthetic ropes, uh, my recommendation is that we utilize the products of one manufacturer and work with their engineering staff uh, to develop safe operating uh, practices. This is uh, exactly what we have done in the past with wire rope and electromechanical cable, primarily working with uh, single manufacturers in those cases. Uh, it is, uh, it's advantageous uh, for many reasons uh, in terms of having a wire pool and having what's available for uh, distribution or for loan. I uh, recommend that we evaluate each proposed use um, the, of a synthetic on a vessel or for a uh, particular cruise. The wire pool will, will work with the manufacturer's engineering staff and establish the parameters on a case-by-case -case basis, initially at least. Uh, this, however, does require a sufficient amount of lead time. And uh, I highly recommend that as soon as uh, there's talk of using a synthetic on a cruise, we need to begin the process of developing uh, an operational guideline for that particular operation. It requires uh, sufficient, a fair amount of lead time, so we got to get on it pretty quickly. Uh, what, we'll, what we will develop from this is uh, we'll establish a history. Uh, we'll learn more about the synthetic. We'll be tracking the double bend cycles. We'll track the maximum tensions, where they occur in the line, actually uh, do some testing, which is exactly what we're going to do with the rope that has come back from the uh, Armstrong that was used on the Armstrong. We're going to, the wire pool is going to do some break test, uh, breaking strength tests. We're also going to send samples to the manufacturer and get their results and then begin to talk about, uh, uh, or at least start to put together a library of uses in the hopes of being able to develop retirement criteria. I don't think that the coring crews on the Armstrong uh, was significantly or significantly degraded the rope, but it's the first uh, primary use so far, and we will continue to collect this information over every use in the future, working with the manufacturer. Uh, if there is no review of a pending operation, my recommendation is that we limit the factor of safety to a five or greater, require a minimum D over D of 40. Uh, we also require frequent break, break tests and uh, some and documented visual inspections. So. We're beginning to put something together that will go into the Appendix A under the synthetic uh, heading. And I'll be working with uh, the safety committee and, and uh, Jeff Garrett on that uh, going forward. Uh, just to mention that uh, we have over the course of, uh, I think probably didn't mention this group uh, since the last meeting, but there is a user's guide now available to help navigate uh, the database. So for those operators who may be new or who have new staff, I would uh, encourage you to point them to this user's guide. It has both detailed and abbreviated instructions. So for those, oper for those you know, where you need, you may be familiar with something, but you don't know the exact uh, sequence of events, we have an abbreviated section, which has just a series of bullets, which you need to do, which is probably gonna be enough to refresh your memory. So you, you can remember how to do things like requesting a break test or editing safe working load information. Uh, it's found in a number of places, uh, particularly on the login page of the database, but uh, throughout several other places. And uh, we're also going to have the user guide in our wire pool a website under the resources category, which is a segue into our uh, next subject, which is the, the website. It's, it is um, 
under construction, but we are hoping we will have uh, information about all the tension members that the wire pool uh, has in their inventory. Uh, also, there'll be resources such as the wire, uh, the user's guide, um, wire pool policy. Uh, also, the talk about putting these kinds of presentations or the test data that we've collected uh, in this uh, site so that you can find them easily. And uh, that's pretty much all I have to say. It is under construction. We're trying to put that information all together and it'll be coming, uh, going live uh, pretty soon. Then the last, last thing I'd like to talk about is uh, what I refer to as our enhanced cable maintenance study. It, uh, what we are looking at is evaluating the benefits of lubricating 322 EM cable more frequently while at sea during haul-in. Um, what we are trying to reduce is port time dedicated to doing lubrication, but the look at the advantages of doing it on the fly at sea. So we have uh, the approach that we're taking is we've got two groups of samples consisting of uh, a total of six 10 meter lengths of 322. And we have for the past 27 months been submerging these samples on a daily basis, Monday through Friday, and they are submerged for several hours. We've been doing it under the Hui dock. We recently moved to a new facility, so we're doing it uh, in another area up here. So after they are submerged for several hours, each sample is coiled up and hung outside in the weather with no fresh water rinse. And the uh, first group, one group consisting of the three samples are lubricated, lubricated monthly. And the second group are lubricated annually as the current uh, recommendation is yeah, right now. Uh, the lubrication is, is uh, uh, applied by the core lube system using uh, what you're all using for lubrication. I suspect it's the Grignard OLLD2 product. Um, the monthly lubrication of the group one samples is done just as the samples come out of the water. There's no rinsing, there's no drying. We pull them out, we run them through the lubricator. Then uh, every six months, a test article is taken from each group for a break test and closer inspection under a microscope. And as I said, we're currently 27 months into what we hope to be a 60 month project. And uh, there's a been approximately or more than in excess of uh, 500 cable dunks uh, during that time so far. So special thanks have to, have to go out to Barbara Callahan who has overseen this, uh, the implementation of this lubrication study because uh, going out on the dock every day, winter, heat of summer, whatever, dunking these samples, um, Barbara's been the one that's uh, done the, the bulk of the work there. And, and I thank her very much for doing that on a regular basis. So how do things look? Well, um, with regard to the condition of the individual wires, the uh, e-kink test, as we, we refer to it, you can see that in group one, the e-kink is, uh, is climbing up. Group one are the ones that are lubricated monthly. So after the, since uh, at the, during the March 2022 uh, test, we had a 5% e-kink, but that really is no concern for alarm. But in the, in the group that's lubricated annually, we're looking at, it jumped up uh, recently in the last couple of months to as much as 55% of the cross-sectional area is breaking, the wires are breaking. Similarly, if you look at the trend for group one, their break test results, they, again, these are the ones that are lubricated monthly. The breaking strength has dropped down from its initial value but it's still well above the uh, uh, manufacturer's minimum breaking strength, which is 10,000 pounds. And 
In the case of the samples that are lubricated annually, uh, it's dropped down a bit more, but still above the manufacturer's uh, breaking strength. If we saw in any samples that uh, are, would be sent in from the uh, fleet, 55%, you know we would be strongly recommending that you uh, cut back, cut back, get into better wire. But uh, it's, uh, it's kind of very interesting to see what the uh, degradation in the rope samples are and are the improvement, let me say that, the improvement of the rope samples uh, for those that are lubricated monthly with no special consideration for rinsing, just it comes out of the water, it runs through the lubricator. Here's a, uh, a close-up picture of the group that's lubricated annually. You can see a lot of surface rust, some surface rust on the group that's lubricated monthly, but a lot of this white stuff is lubricant that's uh, in between the, in the valleys of the uh, armor wires. Just a, a visual there. And uh, that's it. So if anyone's still awake, any questions? So Rick, I guess I have a question. Um, it's interesting to see how much more effective the, the monthly lubing is to keep those cables healthy. Could it also just be a number of times they've been used? In addition to time, number of times. Now, so in other words, you said that uh, two and a half years this project's been going on. This the study, yep. they've been dunked what five hundred times. Yep. So if if an operator cannot perform lubing as frequently as obviously is identified here, is it possible just to count the number of times you've used that cable before you cut back? I suppose I uh, kind of a like a retirement criteria. Right. Right. I haven't uh, I haven't approached it with that in mind. Uh, our our thought was that if uh, if a cruise goes out and uses you know typical length of a cruise might be thirty days. We we made that assumption, and that if the three two two wire was used during that trip, if it were lubricated once a month, that's why we're doing it once a month. Um, but that was our, that was the thought process on how often we ought to do it. And we tried to make it as, as simple as possible. Just have it, have the lubricator right there, maybe even passing the wire through it as it goes on board, it comes on board on one trip, on one, uh, you know, maybe the deepest cast or something. But whether you can use it for future, re, you know, retirement criteria, I don't know if we need to because we're certainly testing. We have the capability to test this wire. We don't mind testing it. We're funded to test it, do E King tests on it. So I think that's a better uh, assessment of the wire than just the number of times it's been dunked in the water because there's lots of variables there. Uh, you know, not just if we're dunking it in the same water, you guys are dunking in all kinds of different waters, different uh, salinities. Uh, I suppose so. Uh, yeah, I, I didn't take that approach, but interesting though. Hi, uh, Don, you have a question? Yeah, Rick, um, any ideas on why not freshwater rinsing? Because like our ship is not set up to put the luber in place to come on board, but we do have the automatic freshwater rinse system. So I was just wondering if that would have any longevity towards the condition of the cable? We were, the way we set up the, the experiment was that there was a little bit of pushback with regard to availability of fresh water from some vessels. So we didn't want to do the fresh water rinse uh, so that uh, that could be thrown up as an argument about this isn't, you know, this is going to be problematic because of the availability of fresh water. I think the fresh water rinse is advantageous. I think it would improve results, but we just didn't want to do it 
uh, for fear that a vessel might not have the have sufficient quantity of water to always be rinsing their cable. Another experiment, you know, that you could do would be to, you know, see what how things improve by just doing a rinse, you know, doing the same kind of experiment, but just do a freshwater rinse. I know some ships, I think, have voiced concern, personnel have convinced some concern about the freshwater rinse and whether it's causing more problems than not. But I don't really, I, I can't see how it might. I think getting rid of that fresh, or rather get rid of the salt deposits off of the, off of the wires got to be advantageous. Any other questions? Okay, thank you, Rick. Yep, you're welcome. Okay, up next is winch pools. Uh, Brian, Aaron, who's going first? Oh, I'll go first. Okay. Um, are you guys gonna play my a presentation or am I gonna take care of it? I, I can do it for you, Aaron. Okay. okay. Whenever you're ready. Right now. You see it? Yep. Great. So I'm Aaron Davis. I'm an engineer working for the West Coast Winch Pool operated by Scripps Institution of Oceanography. Next slide, please. So our, our mission is to uh, supply uh, an inventory of equipment for use on vessels for shared use. Um, we're primary, primarily a source of winches and mooring spoolers, but we have other machinery as well, such as capstans, uh, some tensioning gear, blocks and cranes. And we modify our inventory um, to suit um, the needs of the community. Uh, next slide, please. Who works? Uh, we're primarily funded by NSF. Customers generally contact us via email to describe their project <laughs> to us. If we have a piece of equipment that meets their needs, we send it to the vessel or job site at the appropriate time and, and get it back home when the project's done. Uh, if the project is funded by NSF, it's all done at no cost to the customer. Uh, others have to chip in by generally paying a day rate and the cost of freight. Next slide, please. So what we've been up to, um, one of the main things we've been up to over the past few years is to replace our mooring schoolers with uh, mooring winches. Uh, we, have, we have five TSE spoolers right now uh, that are used for spooling up moorings. Um, they're getting pretty old and they're designed for much light, lighter duty on dry land. Uh, so they've become kind of a maintenance headache uh, among other things. Uh, so in 2020, we began replacing these spoolers by adding two electric hobble winches uh, to the pool, uh, one on the east coast and one on the west coast. Uh, on the west coast, we've gotten lots of positive feedback. Uh, people that used to use the TSE spoolers generally request the mooring winch these days if we have it. Next slide, please. Hey, what's going on? We're currently in the process, or we've been in the process of shaking down the mooring winches and all is not done well. Like I said, the, the, the end users really enjoy them. They work really well for the task of, uh, of yeah. uh, going and retrieving. I woke, up, I woke up like around 12.30 and my alarm clock was blinking on and off. Uh, somebody who's not doing a presentation, if you can mute. So they do a really good job of uh, deploying and retrieving the moorings. And as I said, the customers really enjoy them. However, um, we have had some we have had some problems with them. Little ones are listed here, um, but um, the biggest problem we had is uh, was with the East Coast uh, mooring winch. It actually dropped an ROV on the deck, and uh, so that led to an investigation uh, by Hobolt. We shipped both mooring winches back to back to the factory, and what they found was the problem was multifaceted. Uh, the first problem was the operator was, uh, was unknowingly overloading the winch. Um, most hydraulic winches, when they're, when they're overloaded, they just don't, they just don't, um, they don't haul in anymore. But in this case, it will actually uh, haul, continue to haul in uh, as the motor's being overloaded. So um, 
the motor drive's response was just to shut off, but it didn't it didn't shut off and and set the fail safe brake. So um, Hobbolt has fixed this um, by uh, supplying more feedback to the uh, the motor drive, so it, it knows the position. Um, it's put in fail safes on both the PLC and the motor drive, so that if uh, anything unusual happens, it stops and sets the brake rather than just turning off. Uh, they've also put uh, a power meter as part of the display that the operator sees so the operator can see if the winch is being overloaded. So this took all winter, both, both, um, both winches were out of commission, but uh, the problems are fixed now and uh, we're gonna be using it to, to recover a mooring on the Sproul in the near, near future. Also, it's my understanding that the East Coast pool is going to do some third party verification um, and I'll let them elaborate on that. Uh, next slide, please. Hang on. There you go. There we go. Okay. Um, another thing we've been up to is uh, we've been replacing our light duty winches. We had a Mac winch, which are getting quite old. They don't, uh, uh, they're not Appendix A and B compliant, really. Um, so we've been buying, uh, we got two Hubble light duty winches now, the same winch. Um, a few years ago, we introduced these to the fleet and at first the response was not great. Um, uh, the problem was that the CMAC winch is dead simple. It's got a joystick for paying in and out and an on and off button and that's it. Um, so people, it was very approachable and it required pretty much no training. Um, the Hobble light duty winch does require a little figuring out though. But um, I made a little training checklist that if operators go through it and um, read the list itself and, and read a little section, a couple sections of the manual, then they're pretty well equipped to, to uh, operate the winch without issue. Um, so we got a second one recently. Um, next slide, please. So this winch is also has been in the shakedown period and we have had one major problem with it. Little, a couple little problems which are listed here on the slide. But the, the major problem with it is it's a, my fault. It's air cooled, which was, uh, we did that because not all ships have a good supply of cooling water on board, including the Sproul. Um, but uh, the air cooling fan is very loud. Um, we've got some complaints of, about it. And then more recently, our technicians measured the sound level and found it was 92 decibels at the, at the operator sta station. That's, that's about the same as running the winch with a blender running on your shoulder. Um, so to try to combat that, uh, rather than the obvious fix would be to just replace the cooling fan with a water cooler. But the end users didn't want us to do that. So I tried to quiet it down by replacing louver on the left hand side in the front of the winch you can see there's a large louver i made a silencer for it and lined it with sound absorbing foam and that did an excellent job of reducing the uh the sound level on the opposite side of the winch it it, it uh, reduced it by about 18 decibels but uh, where the operator stands it did almost nothing so we're going to try to uh, i'm going to try to uh, line the the machinery the void where all the machinery is that inside the winch and align that with the sound absorbing foam and then that hopefully that will take care of the problem if not we'll uh, replace the air cooler we'll replace the cooling fan with the water cooler next slide please so in the last year our equipment has supported science uh, funded by nine different institutions uh, it's been deployed upon 11 different vessels on many of these vessels just ride around with one of our pieces of equipment on it all the part. And um, we've, sub we've given spooling services to seven different vessels such as the Oceanus, or the Robert C. Siemens and others. Um, next slide, please. I've also accomplished quite a few engineering projects. Um, I saved us quite a bit of money by creating a new fire plan for Roger Revelle. I needed a new one after uh, getting out of the yards that had a midlife refit. Um, 
when Ravel left the uh, left the midlife refit with a new starboard crane, um, when we use it for cord, there's a there's a sheave in the middle of the crane um, that we use um, when we do coring with the crane. And the sheave that came with the crane was uh, insufficient in our view, so I designed a new turning sheave, and that'll be that'll be installed in the near future. Um, we use the the Ravel usually uses a geotrace system on the starboard side, but there was a used it on the port side, so I, I evaluated the deck and made sure it was okay with the, on the port side, and made some test procedures for our vessels and had the handling systems tested and uh, helped FSU, Florida State University, wanted a, wanted a big long boom on the port side of Roger Ravel to do some watering sample, water sampling with, so I helped them engineer their boom. Next slide, please. And that's all I've got. If you guys need any assistance, feel free to call, call me. Um, we have a new uh, winch pool manager now, Captain Wes Hill. His contact information is right there. Uh, do, I, do you have any questions? Very well, thank you. Brian, uh, Brian I will just, um, I won't get into it in the presentation, but I'll just let you know, we did the uh, testing on the new mooring winch and set it up, um, anchored it, uh, ran a, a line through a crane, a shiv on a crane and suspended 7,000 pounds of weight from it. We then uh, replicated the, the failure with the ROV that we had seen by taking the encoder out of the circuit. And it did indeed on the very first try drop the weight. Uh, the encoder was put back into the circuit and we did multiple tests and each time it handled it flawlessly. So it's encouraging. It looks like they, they nailed the problem. All right. Uh, any questions for Brian or Aaron? Okay. Thanks, Aaron. Thanks, Brian. Oh, okay. Brian, are you doing a presentation oh, at all? I, I certainly can. I have something if you would like to hear it. Yes, certainly. Okay, well, let me get in here and share screen. Okay, well, you're probably seeing the dual image. I don't know, but we'll go from there. So anyway, this is a little talk about the uh, UNL's East Coast Winch Pool. I'm Brian Guest, and I'm the manager. I wanted to say that uh, I'm very happy to announce that on Monday we, we received our new award letter. So we're in business again for 2022. So thank you to the committee that reviewed our proposal and, and Jim Hollick and everybody involved. Uh, we're located at the Woods Hole Oceanographic Institution in Woods Hole, Massachusetts. Beautiful day here today. It looks just like this out there minus the two boats. Our staff is myself, and I apologize to everybody on this screen. Um, the descriptions of their of their responsibilities is very uh, general, to say the least. Uh, Jamie Haley is our systems maintenance person. He oversees the um, all the mechanical systems uh, maintenance for those. Troubleshooting works very closely with Josh Eaton, who is our engineer. Josh engineers our mechanical and electrical systems. And in the past, I've forgotten to mention these two guys. Uh, they're quite important to our wire winding operations, which is Chris Greiner, which I'm sure most of you know, and Jim Fluke, who is a mechanical technician in our facilities, uh, but he operates our big Pine Hill wire tensioning system uh, for a lot of our wire winding jobs. So I'll just touch on what we've been doing and what we're responsible for. We say provide over portable overboarding systems, basically that's winches, to vessels in the scientific community. We don't limit it to just you and alls, it's um, science in general. We're here to help science. Uh, we maintain these systems in proper working order. Uh, Jamie does an excellent job of keeping things in tip-top shape. We work closely with all the manufacturers, 
We also ping on Eric and, and his expertise when we need to. Um, we provide all the shipping logistics to get these systems around the world. They've gone everywhere you can possibly imagine. And we've even had them as far as uh, Antarctica. Shipping there is, is not an easy uh, task, to say the least. We uh, provide engineering solutions and consultation to not just our users of the winches, but also our, our vessels. As oftentimes uh, control issues have come up, there was problems with LCI 90s that Josh was instrumental in helping them work the bugs out of. We provide wire winding services for the UNOLS vessels and sometimes non-UNOLS vessels as well. Uh, we will do import setup and breakdown in the systems uh, I recently, myself, was in San Diego to set up GeoTrace's winch and A-frame system. And Aaron, you'll be happy to know it's much easier to assemble now. We've made some mods. Uh, and we work with the vendors closely on designing our new, uh, new winches that we request when we get funded for them. And we work very closely with them to ensure they meet all the required specifications. This is a list of our equipment for widges, basically. We've, we've got a pretty sizable inventory, although it is lacking a little in the light winch um, market. We, we've had numerous requests lately for systems for towing things like uh, plankton nets and very small, um, small packages on even smaller boats. So that's something I would like to in, increase in the future. Uh, but you can see we have a couple of McCartney winches, uh, a smaller version, which is good to about 3,000 pounds of tension, safe working load, and a mesh 4K, which is good to about 5,000 pounds working load. Uh, sorted Dynacons, our new uh, inter-ocean light duty winch, which I'll, uh, I'll touch on a little bit later on. Uh, and you can see the rest there as they go. Our wire spoolers are providing tension when winding onto the winches. We have a, a TXE wire tensioning spooler. It's simply a mechanical disc brake that we apply tension to. Uh, it's very simple. Um, and our Pine Hill system, which is electrohydraulic, able to provide more tension. It's a beast. It's about 24 feet long by eight foot wide and weighs 15,000 pounds. It's a... Uh, no small job getting this moved around to various vessels to help them out. And I'd like to say um, we've got a few institutions out there. I see a few of the people in attendance today, people from Bermuda and Miami, um, and especially Rhode Island, who have become proficient in using one or more of these machines that we don't even need to send our techs to help with. They're, they're self-reliant and they can operate them themselves. We have an assortment of blocks. Um, most of these blocks, funny enough, have been hand-me-downs that we have refurbished and had tested, uh, but they're all in very good shape. And it was nice to, we didn't have to spend a lot of money to take something that was uh, not being used by somebody else and put it to good use here. And we loan these out and we do not charge a day rate for these. Uh, matter of fact, Noah's borrowing the one in the picture, a 680 block. Uh, for an upcoming salt scallop survey on George's Bank uh, this month. We got an assortment of other pieces of equipment, uh, our turntables, which is an in-house design product, which I'll, I'll touch on in a minute. Uh, a couple of load cells. Uh, we have a quick check tensiometer, not a big fan. It's meant to be able to test uh, line tension when the, uh, with the equipment in line. So, uh, not the most accurate piece, but it's good in a pinch. Our shop is about 2,000 square foot. Uh, it provides us with space, climate controlled space for working indoors. We have a two by two bolt down pattern in the deck of the, of the shop. So we can secure the winch to the deck and do um, static testing, load testing. We have a few slip rings. Um, a few four conductor slip rings typical of say for a, a CTD winch and a single pass two single pass slip rings for fiber and a double pass fiber slip ring 
and two Kongsberg motion references, referencing unit, which are extremely expensive. And I say that because I'll show you something momentarily that's for that, that speaks to that. So one of our newest additions is a winch being uh, fabricated at InterOcean Systems. The factory, factory acceptance test was just conducted recently. Uh, Aaron was in attendance to see it. Uh, the unique part about this winch is this winch was designed and developed in our shop and Josh Eaton and Jamie Haley hold patents on this instrument. It's been uh, licensed to InterOceans to produce. This particular one is a trace metal winch. Uh, it has 3,000 meters of a half-inch synthetic strength member, and it's only four foot by four foot in diameter, not including, say, the, the operator's platform. Now, I hope this works, but let's see. This was a video of the load test of um, the active heave control. And you can see the active the heave control, the, the sensor, in the operator's hand just for this test. It's a very inexpensive device compared to the Kongsberg system. Smaller, lighter, cheaper. Very scientific test, as you can see. <laughs> the parameters can be changed based upon the size of the vessel, uh, the, the placement of the winch, so that the motion of the sensor itself, um, the amount of movement would change the response by the winch depending upon its placement and the, and the size of the ship. Another device that actually came out of our shop that was designed and, and fabricated by both Jamie and Josh and is also part of the licensing agreement with InterOcean is the turntable. And I, I like including this because it kind of got some oohs and ahs the last time we showed it at RV Tech. Uh, this is a mounting system for a winch that allows you to place it on deck and then change the orientation of the winch towards its overboarding point um, to to, to nail it so you're, you're square away. Most people, everybody on the ship, they want the center line with the A-frame. Uh, it's the most desirable location when you're paying gear out over the stern. And sometimes there's multiple systems that are all fighting for that prime real estate. This would allow you to mount it, say, on the port or starboard rail and angle it towards the block on the A-frame. Uh, Jamie in this video demonstrates just how easy it is to move a uh, about a 5,000 pound winch. And this can be done at sea if necessary. It's simply a key pin that you can see on the bottom. It's uh, kind of hidden under the drum. That keyway goes in and locks it into place in about two degree increments. Uh, we're presently building one for Aaron uh, for one of his small winches. And Aaron, we promise we'll get it to you eventually uh, once the slew ring bearing get, comes in, but everything's back ordered these days. Getting a hold of us for your needs is pretty simple. We've had this website for a number of years. Uh, it gives you some basic information about the systems that are available. But the main thing is our winch request form. You can come in here, fill this out, and I'll be in touch with you shortly to clarify a lot of things, no doubt. But this gets you in the queue for a piece of equipment that you need for your science that's coming up. And when those happen, it put, produces a nice little table for me of scheduling for all of the equipment. This is actually our current schedule. And you can see we, this time of the year from March through end of May, we've got quite a few pieces in the field um, at this moment. But there's future to consider. And uh, one of the things we would love to do is increase our shop space. We've been working closely with our facilities department here at Woods Hole to try to in increase the space that we have. This photo was taken in February with only half of our systems being here and it makes it very tight to work on our equipment. So we're hoping we could expand that space in the very near future. Another piece of equipment that would have been wonderful to have during the test of the mooring winch that Aaron and I were speaking of would be a way to dynamically test uh, or to man actually lift the load 
this was uh, a drawing and a photograph supplied to me by Hobble Industries and how they test their systems. It's quite a beast. It's large in size, but this is something that I feel really needs to be done to each and every system on an annual basis at the very least. And we're hoping we can fabricate something up by our winch pool shop in the near future. As I mentioned earlier, we've been a little lacking in the light duty winch department. Uh, I have one very light duty CMAC that is very long on, its, on the tooth. It's been around for over 20 years. It keeps chugging along, but it's not going to last forever. And finding parts to repair these systems is just impossible when they're that old. So we need to look into increasing our inventory on light duty. Uh, we also need to make some modifications to our shop so we can get the large forklifts in to carry some of these bigger winches. The mooring winch itself is a very large piece of equipment. It weighs 10,000 pounds empty. And upgrade our hoist to a seven ton from a five ton just because of that same point. We can't move a few of our winches around using our overhead hoist. But hopefully we'll change that soon. And like the schedule showed, we have a few things going on. This is what's currently out there right now. You know, our ultralight CMAX has been chugging along on the Savannah for almost a year now. Uh, both mooring spoolers are, are being used. One's on Armstrong for doing OOI mooring turnarounds. They just left yesterday morning. Uh, number, mooring spooler number two was uh, being leased by the Canadian Marine Fisheries Service on uh, Atlantis. Uh, a MASH 2K we just sent and arrived in Seward, Alaska, so there's your shipping issue. That's become probably the largest line item in our budgets is shipping. It's, we, we go through great lengths to, to get lots of bids and quotes from reputable companies on these prices, but it's very, very expensive these days, uh, shipping just about anywhere. Uh, Noah's borrowing one of our 6-8 blocks for their scallop survey. That'll go out the door on Thursday, and our Pine Hill is being used to remove Rick's Heiko uh, on May 1st, and we're going to replace it with the 6-8 uh, cable that was on that drum before and lubricate. And then as soon as we finish that job on May 4th, we're going to truck it to Newport, and we're going to swap out a 6-8 wire on the Okeanos Explorer for NOAA. Uh, even as I sit here speaking to you, my email has been going ding, 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 and I know they're all from NOAA asking about specifics on that particular job. So in a nutshell, that's what we've been up to. Um, what we do, what we have, what we'd like to do, and uh, what's going on right now. If, uh, if you have any questions, I'd be happy to take them. Thanks. Brian, is that a tensionometer that's on the... Uh trailer is that hot shotted around or do you have to put that on a trailer to haul it somewhere i'm sorry can you say that again you kind of broke up um i said it is the uh the tensionometer that you have on there for cabling is it it's on a trailer is that just hot shotted around or do you have to put that on another trailer to ship it somewhere oh the the, the tensioning machine yes the, yeah, so the TSE tensioner, the one that has the mechanical brake, has its own axles, so we can hook that up to a truck and tow it. Um, the Pine Hill has to be loaded onto a 20-foot flatbed, and fortunate for us, uh, Woods Hole has a truck and flatbed that doesn't cost us anything, so when we need to move it around, we're able to do that. Okay, thank you. Any other questions? All right, hearing none. Thanks, Aaron. Thanks, Brian. We'll move on next to the van pools. Kaya, you're up. Hello, good day, everyone. All right, uh, could it screen sharing be enabled? There we go. Uh, today I'll be speaking on behalf of uh, the East Coast Van Pool and the West Coast Van Pool. Uh, my name is Kaya Johnson. 
like the other pooled resources, we see, serve the needs of the greater academic uh, research community, and we are funded by the National Science Foundation. Uh, here's uh, a little abbreviation for the West Coast, and uh, on the East Coast, that's uh, operated out of the University of Delaware, and the Van Pool Manager is Timothy Deary. Recent updates, uh, like everybody else that you've heard from today, we've had uh, significant COVID-19 impacts, delays, ship schedules that have changed, and we've had to reship vans um, uh, around the fleet as needed. Um, Coast Guard regulations uh, determination, uh, we received a, a verdict from the Coast Guard clarifying a few conflicts that we identified. We've built a new van, a cold van, and uh, we've switched our LSCs and our red vans to uh, a new brand called Hydex, and uh, all over some projects that we've accomplished. Uh, again, for the COVID-19 impacts, that's just slowed everything down, made it more complicated and more expensive. Right now, we have a, a van that just uh, was offloaded in Guam, and uh, it's taken twice as long and it's costing twice as much to get back. So those are just common uh, frustrations, I think, felt by everybody at this point. Um, we've tried to adapt to those challenges by being more collaborative, working ahead of time. Our partners uh, at the East Coast Van Pool have been a tremendous help. So definitely a shout out to Tim for that. Uh, we've also at times been stretched thin because vans have been tied up in shipping in different parts of the world. So we actually work with our OSU um, Marsan team to borrow one of their vans and outfit it as a general purpose van for a cruise. You can see the picture uh, to the right of that van. From a, a regulatory perspective and uh, uh, a lot of work from UNOLS uh, and Doug Russell in particular uh, on, on that front as well. Uh, at one point, the um, regulations from ABS were in conflict with uh, what Coast Guard rules would apply. Uh, they were taking what's called portable accommodations modules uh, or birthing vans and in, in, uh, in a letter stating that all regulations had to meet those higher level of standards, uh, which most of our vans don't because they're not occupied 24 hours a day. So they don't have the higher fire rating in particular. Um, so that would have been a big issue. It would have made all of our vans um, uh, worthless or unable to use on ships. So we reached out to them after a bit of back and forth. We did reach clarification that uh, we are exempt uh, from the PAM requirements, which was a relief uh, to get that officially from the Coast Guard. Um, and a couple notes, um, if the, the vans are sailed on US flag vessels certified under chapter U, uh, it's no problem to use the van pool vans. Um, they have to be installed in sheltered areas and not staffed in heavy weather. And uh, there are still regional differences with the Coast Guard and the OCMI does have authority um, to say uh, where they can be uh, installed on ships. So um, check with your OCMI uh, when installing vans. Um, all MARSUPs were forwarded uh, uh, the determination back in 2021. And just to clarify, birthing vans or PAMs still have to meet that higher level of uh, requirements. Here's a picture of our shiny new cold van. Um, it took a bit of work uh, with the manufacturer to get it where it functioned and uh, met our standard, but they did eventually um, work with us and sent reps down to tweak the re refrigeration system. Um, and it is up and running good. Uh, we actually sent it out on the Oceanus on our final cruise and it performed very well and uh, employed a, a few new uh, design uh, concepts that we had, had been working on. Uh, as far as our, our red vans, 
Um, we've been wanting to switch for some time. Uh, some of the older Beckman LSCs are no longer supported. Um, and uh, they're very large. And we had multiple contracts with service techs. And um, we surveyed the fleet in particular. We talked to Hui and um, Scripps about the Hydex models. And we found those to be really appealing for a couple of reasons. Um, they're smaller. Um, the service contracts are a lot less. Um, they do not have an active source um, of radiation. So uh, shipping around the world is a bit easier if it uh, isn't radioactive. Um, and uh, the information we gathered from the fleet uh, was very favorable. So we're actually installing those today. We have a, a tech from LabLogic out at uh, uh, Newport uh, installing those. So we uh, are really excited about those and we'll be sharing kind of our uh, experience with the East Coast. And I know they're very excited or interested uh, in how well they perform. And uh, we'd like to switch um, uh, across the fleet if we have success with these. Um, as always, we're trying to keep our vans uh, cleaned, cleaned up, uh, refreshed, good paint, and, and keeping up on maintenance. Uh, so here's a, a picture of our R3 and R4 uh, at a local shipyard where they were blast painted, refurbished. Just trying to show that uh, we are staying up on that stuff. Um, but yeah, that's it. Uh, for contact info, there's my email and uh, Tim's email. Please, uh, with any questions whatsoever, uh, reach out to us early to coordinate details, especially uh, during these COVID times when things are, are slower and uh, take a lot more time to manage. And uh, if anyone has any questions, uh, I'd be happy to take any at this point. Of course, thank you to uh, NSF, Funals, and ONAR. Okay. All right. Don't any, no hands raised. All right. Thank you, Kaya. The, uh, the agenda uh, is going to be modified just slightly. Um, Bob is not going to be doing the ship inspection uh, presentation today. Uh, He's traveling, so we'll be doing his tomorrow. So at this point, uh, we'll move on to John Haverlack, talk about cybersecurity and cyber infrastructure. Now, I know John just walked in the building a few minutes ago, so if he's not up and running, we might be able to come back to him later. Um, John Meyer, are you available? <clears throat> Excuse me, yes, I can go. Okay. We'll talk about satellite communications. All right, John, you're up. That's correct. Uh, stand by. Got me a little off guard, but not too bad. Uh, okay, hi, hello, I'm John Meyer. I'm over here at Scripps Institution of Oceanography. I oversee the High Seas Net project that basically provides your satellite communications for ARF vessels uh, on your ship. Uh, we've been doing multiple projects since about 2020, and since it's been a while since we've had a meeting, kind of trying to give you a catching up since 2020 overview here. <clears throat> uh, so what we'll talk about is personnel changes uh, over here on our team, uh, leasing and day rates, which has been a hot topic of conversation, sat counts, frequencies, uh, overview just for uh, orient everybody real quick, uh, fleet hardware, what we're doing there, bandwidth, cyber guard, which is a cybersecurity related thing, some other activities and uh, open the floor for some for future discussion. Uh, so <clears throat> to run real quickly through our personnel changes, it's been fairly active during COVID. Our primary technical lead, Kevin Walsh, who many of you may have interacted with, uh, made the decision to retire, <clears throat> excuse me, last year. And uh, although he may, remains active on some projects around UCSD, uh, he's no longer working with us, uh, remains a friendly though. Tom Lockwood, who's been with us for about three years, uh, had been working on uh, the high season project in the background and I asked him to take over lead technical duties and he's been doing great. And if you had any sort of internet related problem recently, I'm sure you've engaged with Tom. We had some other people who were less prevalent in the project. Mark Humphrey uh, did work with us on that, uh, but beginning of this year, he moved to a different department within UCSD. 
his effective replacement, Eric Stevens, is joining us in May 22. And so you may start to see his name crop up as time goes on. And of course, Lee, myself, and Kenny Olson, uh, you may have interacted with for some high season related stuff. Uh, we're also um, kind of got disrupted by the pandemic uh, back on track to start looking at a network engineering position to assist with some of the more advanced network integration uh, things that we want to do for the fleet. Uh, going to leasing and day rates. <clears throat> uh, the brief history here is uh, we started this project in 2020 with an ambition to have the day rates recover most of the operational costs. And that's evolved into something different. And the, the punchline here is we tried doing day rates specifically for hardware over in ship ops. And that was not viewed as uh, something that recovered enough funds to be worth the effort it would take for the chip operators. So we're now at the point where that's being funded through directly through NSF, through our budgeting process. Uh, so no more day rates for ship ops. Uh, I know I've gotten a number of emails, with people confused about that. So I want to make sure everybody understood. Uh, current state is those days are over. Um, this also has led us to start to buy leased equipment for ships where we were intentionally avoiding leases to avoid introducing day rates. And that would be for intermediate and smaller vessels. Um, so this year we're actually refurbishing Atlantic Explorer and because it's more affordable from a budgetary perspective, we're going to a five-year lease to refurbish that ship, uh, ship because of this change. Um, the other thing we're noticing is leasing does help with some repair efficiencies because we've gotten the manufacturer Intellian and or our ISP Marlink to come out more readily when we can say, hey, your equipment isn't working how we want. Uh, Quick overview on frequencies. We use several of them, uh, but the punchline here is we use a low frequency like L band, which confusingly is the lowest of all these frequencies, even though it's the highest letter in the alphabet. And uh, if you've seen the big domes on your ship, uh, you might think of them as C band. Um, we're having issues with C band in terms of both finances and logistics. And so we've been using a lot more KU band, a little bit higher bandwidth. And if you're used to Fleet Express, we're using KA band. They all have their benefits and rewards, but the punchline is, is the higher the frequency we go, the more likely that weather is going to interfere with our ability to receive. And so uh, mostly here for reference, if you ever want to look back at it from this talk, uh, information about frequencies here. But if you ever have any question of why we have so many dang doms, this is part of the reason. <clears throat> uh, Hardware, some kind of fun stuff. I guess the big punchline I want to highlight is since 2020, we have replaced 86% of the hardware we have in fleet, or 86% of the hardware on, put differently, put 86% of the hardware installed in fleet currently is two years old or newer. And that's a big change from how we've been able to operate in the past. And we're pretty excited about that. Uh, in our view, hardware has a shelf life. It needs to last about five years. And so the the fact that our sponsors have been so supportive of getting the fleet refurbished in a relatively short amount of time for this scope of project has been awesome. And uh, despite pandemic challenges, uh, that's gone not perfect, but uh, very well uh, for the scope and scale of what we were able to do in the past uh, two years and uh, continue to push forward on that. <clears throat> I won't go through the models uh, that we use, but here they are for your reference if you're curious about them. Uh, what I will say is anything that ends in NX is a low Earth orbit or medium Earth orbit capable system. And uh, so if we're putting two of those on your ship, we are putting that on your ship with two deliberately to prepare for the future. Um, and on top of that, right now, we're starting to do more and more dual dome installs because we can achieve 99% uptime on those systems, meaning we're going to stay online by and large. Again, nothing's perfect, but... Uh, a lot better. Uh, a notable, I should have highlighted this here, but a notable improvement we did see this year was putting two domes on Hugh Sharp going up from one on the Global Express system. And we went immediately to 99% uptime capability. And I think before our stats were looking like 65% uptime capability or something really terrible for the ship. And yeah, they were able to cut over fleet broadband. They weren't offline, offline, but going from a performance capable system to a backup system like fleet broadband not that helpful. So really glad to see improvements like that uh, really help them with internet stability and you know, everybody wins there. 
Uh, we did have some significant failures in the past couple of years. So I've highlighted a few, I left you out. It's not because we don't care, but these are the ones that uh, came to mind as some of the most catastrophic. So we did have a cross-level motor failure on Revell, which is an early one. Just general boilerplate equipment failure. It does happen. It was part of the ship's spares kit, um, but the internet was deemed critical for the cruise that the ship was on, and we actually had to pull into port and effect a repair. And that was a bit of a learning curve for everybody involved. But uh, so maybe a canary in the coal mine of steps to come. Uh, recently, we did have about four months worth of problems between two systems on Thompson, the Global the Fleet Express system rather, and the Sealink system, and the compounded problems ended up with four months of just back and forth trying to triage this uh, definitely some everybody frustrated uh, and you know everybody was patient uh, it, was, it was a difficult process we seem to be on the tail end of that so there were some minor hardware issues going on with that ship and there were some configuration issues some missteps by the network operations center over at Marlink and coordination problems and all that together was four months of pain for the ship's internet, which is terrible. We hope we never see that again. Um, but war story for the, how things can go poorly, I guess. Uh, Ride had some bearing failures and an ICU failure. ICU failure is a, a fairly straightforward one. It did take us a while to get parts and affect the repair, which uh, again was sort of an exercise of multiple months of pain, but we were able to hobble along. Uh, the bearing one I do want to highlight, uh, that is something we see on systems that are pushing five years or getting older than that. We don't do bearing swap outs. Uh, we start to see intermittent failures. That's what we started seeing on Ride. As soon as we swapped out bearings, things got better. We did a proactive replacement of the second dome on Ride. System stable. Uh, pretty happy with that. Uh, another thing to emphasize is good installs take time. And if we're doing a major overhaul, like we've done on some ships recently, I, I think Sean, uh, highlighted this a couple of meetings ago. It, it does take a significant amount of time to do a major overhaul. So we should plan for one to two weeks of install and commissioning uh, for doing a major project. Uh, fortunately, we're on the tail end of that for most of the fleet. So uh, <clears throat> planning ahead, uh, critical annual maintenance is also critical for minimizing the risk of failure. Definitely want to emphasize that. Uh, if we're reaching out to you for annual maintenance and we're not getting a response, and the ship goes out to sea and we didn't have an opportunity to service the equipment, it's, it's going to be difficult to recover from that, especially if the ship's going far afield. And when we had a chance to do the work, the maintenance work space side. Uh, bandwidth, exciting news there. In October, we were given uh, approval to proceed with an approximately 400 boost in throughput. And the primary goal was to get the ship's internet link capable of supporting Zoom's minimum standards which is two megabits. So all links uh, for the foreseeable future are now set to at a minimum of two megabit. That's also right about where the geostationary satellite industry is at in terms of affordable, globally available bandwidth. So we, yes, we can get more. Yes, we can do expansions, but if you want you know, 10 megabits to work everywhere all the time, the logistics of doing that are not as straightforward as I got money, what do I do? Um, so we're, we're kind of right at the sweet spot of available capacity and performance and what we think we can afford. Uh, we did do multiple months of rolling that out. And I think we just got one of the last ships incorporated a uh, Blue Heron into the two megabit baseline uh, a couple of weeks ago. So I said it's approximately 400 meg because we did uh, manage to go four megabits by two megabits on C-Link and two megabits by two megabits on Fleet Express. That means on the C-Link equipped ships, we're getting double the amount of throughput from the shore to the ship. That's generally where we see the need, so that's good news. Um, not, not an available option in the Fleet Express world uh, was in Sealink. So that's, that's the discrepancy there. <clears throat> uh, we're also through uh, the work that John will talk about next, I think, uh, with Cyber Infrastructure Working Group. We're working with Research Sock, and there was a request there to have our satellite communications provider turn on CyberGuard, which is a product they offer. It's basically a tool that's uh, available to evaluate the traffic we're already passing through Marlene. So it's from a, there's no additional equipment that needs to be installed on the ship. It's just a purely a uh, configuration that's turned on back at the Marlink uh, point of presence. And uh, we're in expecting the PO to get cut today with Marlink. So we're gonna light that up. 
Um, there is a spreadsheet of contacts that we're looking to populate. And so if there's any questions about, am I gonna get contacted about this and you wanna be on there, uh, do you have contact info at the end of this presentation? No, please reach out if uh, you have any questions or concerns about that. If you wanna read the brochure, include the URL for CyberGuard here. We are buying the basic version and we're going to custom feed the data that Marlink is collecting to research stock for analysis. And research stock is an entity that I think John will highlight in the next talk, so I won't go into detail there. Uh, some other activity, touch on it briefly. We're investigating some higher performance systems like Leo and Neo, um, global factors like the thing going on in Ukraine have affected uh, launch plans for some of these systems. Uh, it sounds like they're going to be able to pivot and come up with new plans. Uh, Everybody understands that for maritime, we can't get these systems quick enough. Um, but current state, generally speaking, is high performance LEO in particular, is, is just not available yet. There's testing going on right now, but we're in a holding pattern. It's looking like maybe 2025, we might hear some good news about maritime, widespread maritime availability. Uh, another thing we're doing is RV Nautilus was interested in working with Marlink. And we were able to figure out a setup where we can sponsor them into our contract and get the benefit of the ARF purchasing scale and get them a cost discount. And so we all thought that was a good idea to experiment with. We got sign off from Jim over at NSF as our cognizant sponsor that he was supportive of that. And uh, so far, so good. We're happy to be uh, learning what the, more about what the Nautilus is doing and they're getting the benefit of uh, our experience of managing systems for 20 ships. Uh, similarly, we're working with uh, the USAP ships in a similar fashion. That's sort of old news, but uh, continue to support them. Um, we're also in slow but active discussion uh, with MFP and ship scheduling about how we can improve the internet experience in terms of planning for ships. And that's uh, thanks to Doug Russell's effort. Uh, so thanks for inviting us to that. And then been in coordination with Alice on can we start incorporating some coverage maps for internet that are meaningful enough to help PIs plan or, or ship operators plan. So in progress, but stay tuned. <clears throat> uh, and then sorry for the formatting thing here. Uh, I want to talk a little bit about the evolution of internet needs is the last thing. Um, so we all know internet was put on the ship for science. And as we've seen with IMO regulations getting rolled out, ship operators have a clear and present operational need for internet and its security on the ship. Um, recent ABS document uh, that I won't bother reading through here, but you can read it uh, here on your screen, um, basically highlights that increasingly we're going to see internet connected ships for operational systems. And so we've been concerned about this for a while, and I want to suggest that uh, we start to engage uh, with you all on this topic. Uh, how can we how can we uh, provide good internet service that satisfies the needs for all stakeholders involved on the ship? Of course, we want to continue to support science. How do we also address the growing needs of ship operators, uh, which clearly need uh, a stake in how we specify what we need for internet on ship? Um, so uh, as John will talk about, we do have a working group for that. Uh, we're, that working group is looking for engagement uh, from ship operators on cyber issues of cyber security and cyber infrastructure. And I think that's probably the, the first place to talk about it. So uh, strongly suggests that we at least have a, a one-off meeting with any ship operator interested in talking about internet needs for ship operations. Uh, and then finally, I'll point out uh, now that we're buying from the same vendor, uh, who happens to be Marlink at this time, uh, we might see some operational and or logistical efficiencies and or financial efficiencies by looking at some of the other services Marlink has to offer. So I'm not dead set on it. But one thing I keep noticing is uh, we've got these Tempest systems in fleet. They're great. They require integration essentially by the ships, by the ship operators or the tech services. And it, as an alternative, something we could discuss is it would be possible to have Marlink provide that and they would do the integration. and make sure that that system remains functional as something more, a little bit more invisible, you know, easier to just have working. Um, so there's a number of services that Marlink does offer in that manner. And uh, I'm not here to say Marlink's the best thing ever and we should go whole kit and caboodle. Um, but I do want to point out that we are working with uh, currently the most uh, popular maritime set comms provider in the world. 
and they do offer a number of services. And so engaging with ship operators on what they need might uh, also highlight looking into some of what uh, Marlink offers. You know, crew worker welfare, if you're worried about crew retention things is another one that comes to mind for me. So try to breeze through that. Uh, but if there's any questions and we have time, I'm happy to open the floor. Uh, if not, we can move on and uh, ways to contact us or uh, this URL. John, I can just say from you, Taylor, I want to thank you and NSF for funding us. I know putting that second dome on the ship, but it's an older dome was hard to integrate and took some quite an effort from, from you guys, but it's working, as you know, working great. So I appreciate the whole team effort on that. It's, uh, it's great for science. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, the stats on that, that's one of the top dog improvements we've seen. Uh, you guys went from pretty terrible performance to excellent stability. So really happy to see that. Yeah, the, the issue with the sharp is most of you guys know we had a huge uh, like superstructure to put stuff on and there's really no way to situate that size of dome. So we have one in the back and then we um, modified forward of the um, above the pilot house and put it exactly caddy corner. So it's uh, we got 360 degree coverage. Okay, any other questions for John? Okay, thank you, John. Um, we're gonna have a little change in the agenda mm -hmm. again. Um, John Haverlack is not available at this point. Um, so we will move on, um, going on to uh, the RCRV update. Damien, you're up. All right, hi everybody. Let me optimize here. Okay, a uh, long time no <laughs> see. Um, it's good to be here again with everybody, give you a little update about where we're at with the RCRV. I know it's been a long time uh, in coming here, but uh, we are making progress. Um, so for those who don't know, um, we have a project to build three vessels. Come on. Is this working? Okay. Oh, that was Okay, um, three vessels, the RV Tawny to be operated by Oregon State, RV Nares and Dawn to be operated by the East Coast Oceanographic Consortium, and the RV Gilbert Mason, uh, which will be operated in the Gulf Coast by a new consortium down there um, with, basically it's a partnership between LUMCON and University of Southern Mississippi. Okay, um, just briefly, the, the vessels, what it's been for the last several years, about 200 feet long, beam just over 40 feet with a draft of between 13 and or just under 13 feet. Uh, we have reached our regulatory tonnage um, confirmation point. Uh, we are gonna be less than 1600 tons, which was always our you know, drop dead, uh, stay below uh, threshold. Um, and uh, otherwise, it's going to be a very robust uh, regional class research vessel. And so now I'll get into some of our, our status um, as soon as I get through these challenges. Okay, so uh, everybody on the call or most people probably know we've, we've suffered a series of delays uh, for various reasons. Um, I just wanted to kind of quickly recap what those were uh, to sort of set the expectation about where we are and where we're going. Um, so these have been challenging, uh, um, techni technologically speaking and engineering wise um, vessels uh, since the beginning, uh, we're fitting a lot into a small package. Um, it, it's, a, it's a bigger package than it was, uh, which was the only way that we could accommodate so many of our science requirements. Um, early on, we had to add 12 feet, uh, though we still remain less than 200. Um, so we chose our company, in, Gulf Island Shipyard, uh, based on they had the best value proposal, and they were they were partnered with a, a top shelf naval engineering firm, and made their uh, proposal very very uh, promising, looked very strong. That partnership. Well, shortly after uh, we went on contract, that naval architecture firm left, and sort of left the the shipyard holding the bag for engineering, and that really set us back in terms of getting through the 
the design verification process. Uh, so that was uh, uh, kind of a, the next big hit that we had. And then um, the, the lacking their support, uh, GIS uh, had a little experience with these government contracts uh, that the naval architecture firm that they had had a lot of experience uh, with the Navy and other other types of contracts like that. And uh, so they were always just kept playing catch up. Um, and we were kind of helping usher them into the 21st century and how to manage a, a contract like this, but it was always it was always a struggle. Um, but that's changed and I'll get to that in a minute. In 2020, we had seven hurricanes come through, uh, nothing overly destructive in the big scheme of things, but multiple uh, force majeure events set us back in 2020 as a record number of hurricanes made landfall in Louisiana. And of course, COVID-19 uh, really came just after the healing of the third vessel in March of 2020. And uh, it resulted in high absentee rates. You know, Louisiana was really the epicenter of some of the higher numbers there for a long time. Uh, and we've definitely felt the brunt of that uh, across multiple uh, domains with our, our shipbuilding. And then this year, or I'm sorry, last year, uh, we, we received notice early in the spring that Gulf Island was selling their shipyard and it was gonna be acquired by Bollinger. And basically a year ago that happened. And there was a slowdown before as Gulf Island kind of didn't want to do a lot of work that they didn't need to. And then there was a slowdown afterwards as Bollinger kind of figured out what, what they bought and how to, how to get it all accomplished. And so that also uh, set us back. Um, I have got a couple slides here about how that uh, new acquisition is going, but overall I'll just say it's very positive. And then of course, uh, maybe the biggest setback that we've had yet uh, has been the direct bypass of Hurricane Ida, nearly a category five hurricane that made, uh, it's the strongest hurricane to ever hit Louisiana and it made eye passage just over Homa and just to the east of our shipyard uh, with it, a lot of destruction. So we've had our share of, of issues to overcome, but uh, I, I think you'll see here, we are still uh, making some progress that I'm happy to see. Here's our kind of high level to-do list. Uh, we've, we've fortunately made it through the design transfer process, uh, which at one point was not entirely clear we were gonna be able to do with, uh, with the requirements that we had, uh, but now we we are confident that we've got buildable boats and uh, we're well on the way to getting those constructed and then launched. Uh, we expect to have launch here by either the end of the year or early next year of the first vessel. And uh, then effort will really intensify on the second and third vessels because of, of um, the lack of labor availability, largely due to the hurricane, uh, most of the, labor force that we do have is focused on vessel one. Uh, so moving on, the, the shipyard builders trials will be next year and then moving into the shakedown process after delivery uh, and, and ultimately NSF inspection and then it'll be yours. So we're, lo we're all looking forward to that. And so that's the process for all three vessels. Um, and then here's a, I've got a schedule later on to, sh to show you uh, kind of where we're at on that uh, with, with some dates. So Bollinger bought Gulf Island last year. It was overall a very positive, um, a positive change. Uh, I think had we not necessarily made that change, we would be really in a lot worse position now having had the, the hurricane strike that we did. Uh, Bollinger, a lot of you've heard of and probably worked with, they're, the, they're now the just privately owned country, a uh, yard in the country. Uh, so they've got a lot of resources to bear uh, to bring uh, to the fight. And uh, we've seen evidence of that already. Uh, they've got a long history of successful projects for the Coast Guard and the Navy, and they know how to run a project like this. And so we've seen market improvement across the board with safety, with management, with customer service, um, and, it, and also quality. So uh, it's overall, it's been very, very good. And although we had a little delay as the transition was made, I think we made it uh, through that kind of turbulent period uh, and on to um, where we're seeing a lot more efficient uh, work out on the yard. Last August was Hurricane Ida. Again, uh, 130 knots sustained. This is what the, 
the yard looked like. Uh, we took a significant flooding. The break wall uh, gave way, and there was flooding all through here to the to the north and also to the west. Um, here's our little island here. It, it, it could have been a lot worse. Let me just say, uh, you can see down uh, in the southern part of the frame here. Those were some warehouses in which our many of our components were stored. They were temporary, kind of big, big top, big tents, um, meant to be able to withstand these kind of winds, but you know, nearly, I mean, it was, they were meant to withstand category three. So when we hit four and nearly five, uh, they gave way. Uh, our, our vessels are being made in this, this fab shop. Uh, we, I was afraid when I didn't know what was going on that our vessels had actually blown over and uh, some major setback like that was just waiting for us, similar to what happened with Chile with the earthquake uh, a decade ago or so. Uh, but fortunately, that was not the case. Uh, they took some crane damage uh, and you know a lot of water damage and so forth but overall uh, the insurance and, and their builders risk is going to cover what what there was for the large part uh, to uh, some of our equipment um, and so that's being taken care of and um, but largely what we've seen is the impact has been uh, due to um, the devastation of the local area I mean er everyone down there you know in the Homa area and then moving east towards Lockport has been affected. It's, it's a war zone. I mean, it was, it was really, really something to see. I lived through several hurricanes when I lived on Guam or typhoons actually, but the, the, the extent of the damage here was just really mind blowing and really heartbreaking. And as a result, people needed to stay home, take care of their families, dig out, um, work through all of the problems with their, their own personal lives. And we're only now starting to see people starting to come back to work. Uh, they could make more money roofing, uh, you know, doing this this repair work, and so uh, all the yards were struggling to find people to work. Uh, we work, but we've been working with Bollinger to come up with some incentives and ways to lure people back to the shipyards where it's worth it to work, uh, rather than stay or work in some of these other kinds of projects. Now, just an extent of the damage. So Katrina had a lot of flooding, but Ida really brought the wind, and you can see here. Uh, nearly twice as many, this is a, a metric for hurricane destruction, uh, nearly twice of twice as many poles were down from Ida than from Katrina. Uh, and so that just, everywhere you went, it was just, it was nothing worked. And that just went on for months and months. Uh, they've, they've done a great job bringing the yard back to a usable state. Uh, within a month or two, they were kind of up and running. At least they would have been if they had anybody to work. Uh, but we've had, uh, they rebuilt the tents kind of bigger, stronger, better than the, uh, what they had more. Uh, they've, they've moved up their long-term yard repair plan. Uh, so the, a lot of things that they had that were scheduled years out are getting accomplished or already complete. Right, and we're starting to see uh, labor come back to work. And so all that's, all that's good. Um, but nonetheless, we have had a setback uh, from our uh, baseline schedule that we've been operating to uh, since essentially last summer uh, that incorporated some of our COVID problems. Uh, this is just a draft. This isn't for public dissemination. I mean, I know there's a variety of folks on this call, but what we're working on is um, essentially a six month delay uh, to what we're, and this is not contractually set yet, but you know, this it's going to be around that, uh, that we expect um, a shift from our current baseline. So we were going to launch in September of this year. This is vessel one uh, that moves out to early next spring, uh, we expect. Uh, so you can see the, the, the various deliveries of the vessels. We're now looking at OI one, or Oregon State's vessel, uh, sort of September of 24. University of Rhode Island East Coast vessel a year, uh, six months later in the spring of 25. And then in the early, early fall, we have hope to have the third vessel complete. Uh, again, this is all notional. Don't hold me to this. Uh, we're, we're, fi we're finalizing our discussions with both uh, the NSF and the shipyard now to kind of come up with a new baseline schedule that we ha hope to have implemented by the summer. Okay, uh, darker colors are typically better. Uh, this, is the this is the vessel progress for the three vessels. Uh, you can see a, a large part of 
uh, Tawny is, is moved into outfitting, which means it's already moved past paint and uh, erection, which is good. Uh, Vessel 2 sort of lagging behind, but there is uh, quite a bit of work that's been complete and ongoing. Vessel 3 is the most behind. Um, not a lot of progress has been made, as I, like I mentioned, it, the, the staff that they do have has been has been reallocated to Vessels 1 primarily and also Vessel 2. Uh, but work is getting uh, complete for Vessel 3. And, and I should say all nearly, nearly all of the deck handling equipment, internal work, uh, like the motors and generators, bridge equipment, those kinds of things, all that's completed. Uh, so what I'm just talking about here is the, the, the whole construction. This is a real time picture Lee, from the uh, superstructure the aluminum superstructure that's being made over in Emilio. Uh, they've made great progress. This was this morning. Uh, you can see we got the mast installed, the flying bridge looks good. Uh, they've done great work in aluminum, we're really excited. And uh, what you can't see is uh, aft of this picture is there's, a, they've started to do the similar work on the, on the second vessel. This is way ahead of the plan um, where we expected to be with aluminum at this point because uh, Gulf, uh, where, where this is at over in Morgan City, Amelia area, uh, the, it was not hit by the hurricane as much. And so they've been able to make good progress. Uh, this will get barged over and uh, mounted onto the steel structure, probably I'll say early August of this year. So it'll really look like a ship at that point. Uh, so this is, mod uh, this is, um, this is a shot of one of the generators, a uh, CAT uh, C32 um, being uh, guided in to the engine room. And I'll just a short series of pictures here to uh, show you how that developed. Uh, so those are the three generators installed here. This is mod 32 uh, being rolled up and then erect and then joined and erected with uh, mod 31, this auxiliary machine room. And then um, th as of this morning, this is from the other view uh, looking direction, but this is this is the engine room with the, the generators under here that in this gray deck. It's been uh, as of a week and a half ago, uh, it's been, it, the seams have been laid in and the, the super module has, has grown. Uh, this is the start of the back deck. This is moving, looking forward, that's that's the center board and, and this is the uh, main crane. In the, in the background though, we've got uh, vessel two. So, uh, that's the bow area for uh, the Narragansett Dawn uh, waiting to grow. A couple more pictures from Narragansett Dawn just show that there is uh, progress being made. And uh, I didn't want to just put in some janky pictures of some mild steel work that's happening for Vessel 3, but just to show that we, we are having a final test and accepting acceptance test for the main deck handling equipment for all three vessels. Uh, these have happened in the last uh, several months. And uh, also back here in Corvallis, a lot of work is getting done to integrate these ships into the fleet, uh, make sure that they're uh, going to be able to do the science that they have been made to do. Uh, so we've got a team that is um, ensuring that all the sensors are, are ready to go, uh, bench tested, integrated with our larger data presence system, which I've talked about previously. Uh, we've got uh, all, a lot of the outfitting equipment purchased and ready to install. And um, yeah, so we've got a whole facility here that's, that's um, it, it enabling us to, to, to be ready so that when the vessels have been delivered, we'll show up with our teams and get the, the ships finalized and ready for shakedown uh, as quickly as possible. I, we've got, I think, a really solid plan for that. Uh, also, some of these other larger procurements are happening uh, as well. Okay, uh, this is my last slide, and uh, let's see if I can get this going here. It's just a, it's, it's only two minutes, so uh, it's just a quick status. And let's see if I can get this to work. Well, there you have it. Maybe we don't get to watch it. All right, well, it's a very exciting video and y'all would have loved it, but it's on our webpage. Uh, so sorry about that. Right. And uh, that will conclude our um, update. Any questions for Damien? Tim.
Yeah, afternoon, Dan. Are all the uh, all the propulsion and uh, gen sets tier four on the uh, on the vessel? Are they? I'm sorry. Are they? Are they what? All tier four. Oh yes, sure. Yeah, they, they sure are. And is it a urea solution? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. The uh, DEF is just your standard urea solution. Yeah. Understood. Thanks. Mm -hmm. Okay, any other questions? Thank you, Damon. All right, thank you. Okay, uh, next up, um, Sean Higgins talking about uh, Langseth replacement. Sean, you're up. Oh, thanks, Doug. I'm just happy to make it back in time. Good timing here. Um, now, so, uh, so I've got a new plan. I'm gonna slip a new vessel in behind you know, Damien with that, see if he doesn't notice and uh, just do the refit right along with his right there. Uh, but uh, now it's an amazing amount of work. I was on the review panel with the, that, those ships. So it's amazing what's gone on with those. Um, but as far as the Langseth replacement, I'm not gonna show any slides with this, but just give an update. Um, we're continuing to work through a lot of the background financial folks, uh, you know, with uh, here working internally. Um, continue to have meetings. Um, I went over to London uh, in March, met with um, some shipbrokers there um, and some shipyards and stuff, talking about refit, talking to people interested in potential project management for, for this project. Uh, I've been talking to a lot of uh, people around the, uh, the fleet, and Mike Prince, Bruce Applegate, and others that have been involved in some of these. I'm sure I'll talk with Damien here at some point um, as well. But uh, just get an idea of, of fleshing out the financial picture for, uh, you know, for all the people above me and stuff there that we're looking to continue. So um, a lot of things happening on that front. We've started engagement with the Marine Seismic Research Oversight Committee to kind of talk about capturing any changes in the in seismic needs or requirements and stuff from that, uh, making use of the new global science mission requirements uh, that were just released recently. Um, as well as some of the, the past ones uh, to capture different elements and uh, you know working with the directorate here to start sort of building up uh, or bringing back into existence sort of a, a science mission requirement team here at Lamont as well that will kind of partner with others as we develop these things here but still looking at you know refit of an existing vessel um, and we'll we'll see where that takes us so we're building up a list of, of opportunities that we've been talking to a lot of people about and, um, you know, still at this point, you know, targeting Langseth, you know, retirement sort of in late 24 and hopefully a new vessel coming online, you know, hopefully by 2025. And that's sort of our current timeline as it exists right now. Hey. Yeah. Any questions for Sean? Okay, thank you, Sean. Yep. And uh, next up, uh, John Beakey with uh, Savannah Midlife. All right, thanks, Doug. Um, yeah, I've got a slide on, or yeah, presentation to share here. See if that'll come up. Y'all see that? Yes, yes indeed. Okay. okay, very good. Okay, again, yeah, I'm John Bickey. I'm the Marine Superintendent here at Skidaway and uh, managing the uh, the refit for the Savannah. Um, <clears throat> I guess the last uh, formal update on this project was back in 2019 at the, uh, the FIC meeting. Um, so, Many years ago, lots happened, um, and happy to say that uh, you know we've we've we're in the design phase, well into the design phase now, and we have secured our funding. So some big strides there. Um, I guess I'll start with just just a basic background on the vessel for those of you who don't know. But uh, the Savannah is 22 years in age this year. Uh, it was delivered to Skidaway in September 2001. Um, it was funded by 
University Systems of Georgia Board of, Re Board of Regents as a capital improvement project. Uh, NSF uh, supported a lot of the deck machinery uh, instrumentation through equipment grants and then skid away broad institutional funds as well. So $3. million project for the full build. Um, she was, she's 92 feet long, 27 foot beam. Uh, so, you know, kind of a background on kind of this project's timeline, uh, you know, well before 2017, we were kicking uh, the midlife refit around, uh, trying to wrap our heads around it. We first went to uh, UGA and the Board of Regents 2017, um, expressing the, the need for this project, uh, to extend the service of the vessel for another 20 years or so. We developed uh, advisory committees uh, internally, skid away, uh, ship advisory committee and a science advisory committee. The science uh, was made up of folks here at Skidaway who were the primary users. And then we brought in some, some PIs from our loyal users uh, in the Southeast. We had a condition survey back in 2019 that gave us some, some budget numbers that, to kind of work with the really rough estimates on project costs. And then, you know, of course, uh, the recommendations uh, based on the, the survey uh, and we also made our first pitch to the state for funding, and that was uh, rejected. So <laughs> it didn't start off too good there with the funding side of things. But uh, going into 2022, uh, funding started shaping up uh, UGA uh, internally, uh, is committed to a one one match with Skidaway funds. Um, so that was good. And by 2021, we uh, signed a contract, executed a contract with Sea Job Naval Architects out of Houston. And now we're fully in the design phase of the project, um, finally. So, and most recently, we received uh, at the state's uh, B budget award a $2 million award. So now our funding's pretty much set. Um, we've got a good budget to work with, we hope. And again, we're in a design and engineering phase, hoping to get a shipyard RFP out by July into July, August, uh, with hopefully a contract by the first of 2023. And we're starting, we got you know, some, some long lead items that uh, we're gonna start procurement on uh, any day now, really. They're in the final phases of getting those sole source justifications and, and all those bids out. So I've provided a kind of a short list of the big projects um, that Savannah's hoping to accomplish, uh, some of which will definitely will accomplish, and then the others, um, you know, we hope to. It's just all going to, you know, depend on, you know, what the shipyards come back with in terms of construction costs and, and then our budget. But we do intend to replace uh, the main engines and our transmissions and controls, replacing the generators, uh, which are just you know, hanging on by a thread, uh, hoping to get to the finish line on those. And you know, our generators now are all manual. So if an engine generator goes down, you know, somebody's got to be in the engine room, turn the other generator on, switch power back on. And uh, so these new generators will be smart generators talking to one another. If one goes down, the other one will fire right back up. And we're looking to put those uh, generators in parallel if we need to for additional power. Um, we're going to replace the switchboard. Uh, the bow thruster is underpowered. Uh, it needs to be replaced regardless. And it's looking like that project's going to involve a new tunnel as well, a bigger tunnel for bigger thruster, bigger thruster uh, for DP uh, needs. Um, and then we've got your standard you know, tank work, bilge resurfacing, um, kind of catch up on all of that, pipe replacement in those tanks is, is uh, in need, I should say. Um, got some HVAC modifications uh, on, the, on the service life extension side. And on the emission enhancements, we were hoping to get a 12 foot deck extension on the vessel to accommodate a 20 foot band that's uh, positioned you know, about a stern. Currently, we, we can't do that. We've got a 10 foot band that we can, we mount on kind of the port side towards the center 
So uh, we wanted to, that capability. And plus we just, you know, that's one of our limitations is that deck space. So an extra 12 feet uh, will go a long way, uh, increase our capabilities. Um, the the A-frame needs, uh, some, has some clearance issues sometimes in some packages. Um, so we're gonna increase the height clearance of the A-frame and we're also repositioning the cylinders to give us a little more lifting power. They're not really right, quite positioned correctly when they're when the frame is inboard. Uh, we've got J-frame modifications uh, to increase clearance there as well, vertical clearance. And considering uh, swapping that frame around uh, so there's better uh, visibility from the, the winch and frame operator. Right now there's the frame is kind of in the way, so there's a you know a, a brief blind spot as packages are going on off the vessel. So you know increased safety there, um, and also uh, right now our J frame has just one cylinder, but it's 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 off center and it's it's a kind of an odd shaped J frame, and so it's getting a lot of twisting and uh, just causing havoc with the with the the mounts, the pins. We're having to constantly kind of rehone those and replace those. So uh, hoping to correct that with just a just a one pipe uh, J frame with one cylinder. We've got uh, some some work, hopefully to our transducer well to increase the size so we can accommodate uh, two ABCPs. Um, currently we, our, our moon pool is just big enough for one. So if we have cases where we need to have two on board for different depths, we can, you know, we'll have them in position ready to go. And if we have to put a bigger sonar in there, a multi-beam or something, we'll have more space. Uh, accommodation upgrades uh, in the lower deck of the cabins, kind of giving those a, uh, a facelift, increasing you know, space and just living comfort, uh, flooring, ceilings, uh, uh, and same goes for the labs. You know, kind of repositioning the labs to a certain degree, new flooring, uh, that kind of thing. And, um, and then the other big one is the you know trying to implement a dynamic positioning system on the vessel DP1. So those are the big projects. Of course, that's that's just a few. Um, I think I've got over 40 projects in all, but uh, these are the biggies. So you know, looking at the engine room, uh, this slide shows on the left the the, the, the main engines that we're hoping to acquire these uh, Caterpillar C18s. Right now, there's a, a lead time, I believe, of almost 70 weeks. So, and that went from 40 weeks about, I don't know, three months ago. So, we're, like I said, we're, that's, that's another reason why our, our shipyard period is a little bit delayed. We were hoping to get in a shipyard this year, but just wasn't going to happen. So, um, we're looking at a shipyard period in fall of 2023. But those CAT C18s is a direct replacement for our 3406Es that are on the vessel. And below that is that, that CAT generator we're hoping to acquire. Uh, it's 118 kW. The generators we have now are 90. So we're increasing our capacity, the load there, which we'll need if we do the go to DP to run, run that new thruster. It's going to be a little bit more horsepower. Um, on the right hand side here, you'll see a, a schematic of uh, looking overhead at the engine room. Probably hard for you to kind of see what's going on here, but this is one of the concepts from the architectural group on how to get machinery in and out of the, the engine room. There is no access, quick access hatch for that right now. So this is what this is showing is in the red there is, um, there's a cutout. I don't know if you can see my cursor or not, but um, there's a cutout here on the starboard side. Um, that's where the switchboard is now in the engine room. Make a cutout there and then pull everything out of that hole. Um, another concept that was developed was going through the bottom, but a lot of different reasons we didn't we didn't like that. Um, we still were exploring potentially going out the side, uh, most likely on the port side, um, but that would involve going through a, a day tank. Um, so we're, we're still looking at that as a possibility. 
the stern extension, here's a latest drawing of that. Um, so I've kind of marked in here where the current transom is, <clears throat> excuse me, and, uh, and where the kind of the, where the van would sit. So it's a tight fit with the van, but it, it'll fit in there. We've been assured. Um, and as you can see, there's, there's no change to the running gear, the rudders. We're gonna kind of, one of the goals was to leave those in place for cost reasons primarily. Um, but with a 12 foot extension there, we can put a 20 foot van on the vessel. Um, let's see, this next view is an overhead of that. So this, this line here is the existing. So as you can see, we're gonna, we're gonna gain quite a bit of deck space that's, that's needed. Um, and the van sits in there nice and snug. And by the way, um, I was saying we got, had a contract with Sea Job as the primary naval architects, but they have actually subcontracted Gloucester for the extension project. So they're actually Gloucester is developing these, this design, these drawings. A, a 3D of those, uh, that extension. And you'll notice uh, at the top here is the as build. So essentially red is below the water, blue is above. With this 12 foot extension, the way it's designed now where there's no change in shape of the, the hull, um, there's gonna be exposed transom, if you will, um, at, uh, you know, working draft, which, you know, is, Bringing up a few concerns and um, with with slamming, um, so we're still tossed around the idea of potentially curving that out. But what we're what, what I'm hearing is that that's going to reduce maneuverability. It's going to increase costs. Um, what was the other one? There was some other other reason that that was not not ideal. Um, but at any rate, that's that's the current current design. So cost estimates, this is fairly recent estimate based on what we what we know. Um, we've got the contract with Sea Job. Uh, you've got your routine kind of dry dock maintenance uh, and then our service life extension work, mission enhancements, and then we put a 20% markup on that. So current budget, if you will, I guess is estimated budget is um, our cost is 4.2 million, somewhere around there. Uh, the funding that's secure, we've got 4.6 million in hand, um, which is good. Uh, <clears throat> if you recall, the, the, the ship build was 3.1 million back in 2001. So, um, but the funding sources, uh, as I mentioned some previously, the University of Georgia, uh, the state funds, uh, NSF, uh, nice contribution there. And then of course we have ship funds as well. So again, a timeline um, of our shipyard in green there is we're hoping to, to enter the shipyard September, October, uh, 2023. Um, you know, what, what is, and we think, we think we're going to make that, we shouldn't have a problem with that. Um, you can see procurement starting here soon, got some long lead items, but if you know, something changes, we should be good. Uh, the design and engineering is well underway. We're, we're going to have our shipyard RFP out here. I was saying into July. Uh, so hopefully by the, the start of 2023, we have a, a shipyard under contract. But we're, we're playing around with the idea, or I should say we're not playing around, we're concerned, or I'm concerned with an extended shipyard period, you know, that's going to go beyond six months. And from talking with some shipyards, and if, if the scope of work is completely uh, that, I've, that we're laying out, if, it's, if, if, if we can fund it all, you know, we're concerned that this is going to go beyond six months and the shipyards or that I've talked to think that it probably would. So by doing that, we run the risk of, uh, you know, losing some, some users, losing a lot of crew. Um, so we're, 
in this RFP, we're actually going to request two estimates. Um, one being for a one shipyard period, uh, starting in the fall of 2023. And then if, if needed, if it's just too long of a duration beyond six months, having a shipyard period to, uh, fall 2024. So I have two shipyard periods. And that way we, we're hoping that we can have more better crew retention and be able to serve our users, our loyal users that we've had for many years, primarily NOAA um, and some other NSF projects that are pending right now. So that's to be determined, but we're pretty certain we'll be in the shipyard fall 2023, conducting either all or, or most, most of the, uh, the projects. Uh, so that's that's basically it um, as, as this update. Um, can't uh, can't thank State of Georgia, University of Georgia for funding support, and Rose and NSF. Um, I've talked to a lot of folks along the ways. This has been going on for years, but certainly early on, Turner at the RV Connecticut was uh, helpful, as was Joe, that alumcon, and uh, recently I've been talking with some of the folks on the RV Virginia who had a recent build. So. With that, I'm happy to take any questions. Oops. John, who's going to who's going to manage the project for you at the shipyard? So we've, um, as part of the the contract with Sea Job, they're going to have management. They'll be they'll helping us manage the the shipyard phase, the construction phase. Great, thanks. Yep. I don't know. If, are you? Can you get the screen back, or how does that work? You can uh, stop sharing. Oh, I can do it. Do it for you. Okay. Okay. There we go. Any other questions? Anybody else? Okay. Thanks, John. Yep. Oh wait, wait. I guess Rose has a question. I was just going to say that. Um, I was able to provide year end money to skid away for their project. So if you have a shovel ready project and I have money at the end of the year, um, I'll, you know, contact me. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Rose. <laughs> All right. Uh, so the final presentation today, uh, John Haverlack talking about uh, cybersecurity and cyber infrastructure. John. Can you guys hear me okay? All right. I'm clear. Can you, my, can you see my screen? Yes. All right. Minimize my window here. All right. Yes. Sorry about the time zone screw up. That's totally my fault. Later. Uh, hmm? So I'm right along. So this Later. is the ARF cybersecurity okay, program presentation. You got uh, from. Uh, I'm representing okay. the cyber infrastructure come over working that? group. Well, I mean, I'm sorry. In, in this. It, just a minute, uh, John. Hey, so if you're not presenting, please uh, uh, mute your microphone, please. Thank you. Okay. All right. Um, so this is the Cyber Infrastructure Working Group that I am representing. I'm John Haverlack from the University of Alaska Fairbanks and RV Sapuliak. Um, and uh, CIWG is colloquially uh, short uh, CIWG. So you'll see that term around. Our email address is CIWG at unals.org. All right. So in this presentation, we're going to talk about related agencies, regulations, the ARF as an NSF major facility and our cybersecurity responsibilities, the ARFCI working groups activities, uh, security staffing, cybersecurity staffing levels, and what we would like to engage with RVOC on, uh, what CIWG would like to involve, what we, what we need from RVOC. Okay, we have in the academic research fleet many vessels um, that are, re that are re remote research platforms operated by different institutions. We have really constrained bandwidth at sea, limited uh, low bandwidth, high latency internet connections, which complicate our ability to do, to, to operate cyber infrastructure the way many institutions do, uh, which have faster connections or better internet connections. And to complicate things, CI and CS are governed by multiple entities, uh, internal and external to institutions um, and different and different external agencies as well. Some of those agencies include the International Maritime Organization. Uh, you're probably familiar with this. This was the most recent activity that's happened as of January 
1st, 2021, each vessel is required to have a cyber risk management plan as part of their SMS documentation. So everybody should have that by now um, and we're being inspected on it. The Coast Guard, that, that inspection is being implement, or, uh, done through the Coast Guard and through ABS. Um, and in addition, the Coast Guard is also recommending that we follow the CISA or Cyber Infrastructure Security Agency's guidelines, which is a US, uh, provides cybersecurity resources for US government agencies. Additionally, ONR has oversight for ONR owned vessels and DOD funded projects have a different cybersecurity certification model called CMMC, the Cybersecurity Maturity Model Certification um, and that has to be done at the institution level. So that's not done on a per vessel level, but each of your universities or institutions will be impacted if you have DOD funding. Um, and then the National Science Foundation Major Facilities Guide has some requirements for running for cyber infrastructure plans and programs um, that, are, that are part of section 6.3 in the Major Facilities Guide. Okay, so I kind of summarized, to summarize some of those, there, there are kind of three major things we need to be concerned with. The IMO regulations and that documentation and, and or framework that we're using is called the Cyber Risk Management Plan or CRMP documentation that each vessel maintains under their SMS. It, the responsible party is the vessel operator. So the Marine superintendent and or his designees, wh whoever is responsible for the SMS documentation. The I, um, there's a template here. You can, if you have access to this presentation, um, the link can be shared publicly. Uh, th there's, a, there's a spreadsheet that shows the controls. I'm not gonna go over them in this presentation, but there's effectively 23 things that need to get checked off as yes, we're doing this to, to meet the CRMP requirements. Um, and then the, and, and in my estimation, that's somewhere between five to 10,000 hours of work that needs to be done on, in our case. Um, the DOD regulation uh, comes from, stems from DFARS. It's changed a lot in the last years, last year or so. And the most recent guidance is a recently released CMMC 2.0 documentation. There's also a SPRS registration that you need to do at your institution level. Um, hence the responsible party is the university or institution here. And so they are gonna be the coordinating body that you will, and they're, what they have to do to meet CMMC 2.0 regulations will impact vessel operations at universities. Um, the level one is probably where most of us are gonna fit and they have 59 objectives that they need to check off. So the IMO has 23, the level one, the university has to check off of 59 appliances. If you're a level two, if you have, I think, controlled unclassified information, which most of us probably don't, but some of us may, then I think it's 110 controls. And then the level three, they haven't provided guidance on yet. At the time of the writing of this presentation, I don't think it's changed in a week. Um, and then the NSF major facilities guide, uh, what the US academic research fleet has done is we've contracted with a research SOC, which is based out of Indiana University, to provide us a fleet-wide cyber information security officer or CISO. Um, and the, the documentation for that is the, the requirements are in the major facilities guide and the trusted CI um, framework is what is, is being used. And it has 16 criteria that we're want, going to want to meet fleet-wide um, for those concerns. So that kind of breaks down the three regulatory areas and who's responsible and what frameworks and documentation are associated with that. The academic research fleet as a major facility, one of the goals that the NSF has put forth is that it's essential that each major facility science is transformative and not limited or transformed but not limited by the cyber infrastructure. Um, so we want it to facilitate and make things better and not get in the way so that there's kind of a a complicated goal and a difficult balance to strike between security and usability. Um, it's definitely a spectrum. Within the US academic research fleet, uh, our coordinating body is UNOLS. I think everybody here is familiar with that. And we've historically had two main areas uh, of funding. We've got tech services. Uh, the community is represented by RV Tech and the program manager is Jim Pollock. 
On the operations side of the house, we've got RVOC and rows to four. And we're talking about a possible future where we, because cyber infrastructure services have historically kind of fallen to techs to deal with. Um, and there's, there's various, the funding for it falls under Jim's budget. There's the High Seas Net Group, there's the Sat Night Group, there's the CIWG, who's mostly represented by folks from tech services. And now we've included research SOC in that scope. Um, we think because it serves uh, both operations and RV Tech that maybe it needs to sit somewhere in the middle and have its own program manager with dedicated funds. Currently, if we go to buy servers or hardware or firewalls, we're, we're often doing proposals that compete with tech services with scientific equipment, and that, that's not really appropriate. So we're, we're talking about maybe having a different structure in the future. So that's been talked about. There, it's to be determined. It's been done yet, um, but that could be a future we're looking at. Um, one distinction that, that has come up frequently that's often confusing is the difference between information technology or IT versus operational technology or OT. And this is actually terminology that's used. Let me go back to this slide. There's this um, BIMCO guidelines for cybersecurity on board ships. They actually break out the IM, in the IMO documentation the difference between IT versus OT. And just as kind of a general rule of thumb, things fall along these lines. There's different security zones on board ship networks. We've got transient systems for science party crews. Think of it as the ship's Wi-Fi. We've got, we've got shared infrastructure that is, um, or is kind of the infrastructure on the ship that's necessary to make things work. Uh, ship side web servers, printers, file shares, DNS, other things. We've, and then we've got the ship's data acquisition systems that actually do the, the work of collecting the data. Um, on the other side, we've got some OT systems or operational technology systems, such as engineering systems, bridge systems, CCTVs, there's others. Um, and those are mostly air-gapped or isolated networks on vessels that do not talk to or connect to the other ship's network. Uh, we also have operational technology kiosks that do talk to the internet. Um, and so they're, they're, they should ideally be separated from the transient systems if they're permanently installed on vessels. But just kind of a breakdown of our security zones and, and how we think about the difference between OT versus IT. One distinction, there's a, there's a big read on this, uh, I'm not gonna do in this presentation, but they think of OT as things that are control systems that actually interface with physical systems, uh, like power systems, things like that. And the reason we air gap them right now is because we don't want to have a risk that, that they're exposed to the internet or could be hacked because we don't want to break a ship or put an engine on fire because somebody compromised our security. Um, and it's very important to have those systems air gapped, but there's a lot of pressure from vendors these days to be able to have remote connectivity into them. So that's another challenge that we're dealing with. The Cyber Infrastructure Working Group has been loosely, we, we didn't technically get formed, I think, till 2021. Um, but we've loosely been working on the same people have been working on on this effort since 2019. We did an engagement with the Trusted CI group. If you don't know Trusted CI, they're a National Science Foundation Center of Excellence for Cybersecurity for large research facilities. So they're a very specific fit for what we did. They, they did an assessment of the fleet and we came up with a report um, with recommendations. We followed up in year 2020 to try to get in front of the IMO 2021 CRMP deadline. And during 2021, we wound up contracting with a company called Peregrine uh, to draft up our documentation, to get us a CRMP, to get us started on a pathway uh, to, to meet the, the, the 2021 CRMP requirements. As I mentioned before, this is enforced. These are guidelines that are created by IMO guidelines, but they're being enforced through ABS and the Coast Guard. In 2022, we've dropped the Peregrine contract and are deciding to move forward with Research SOC to manage the cybersecurity program moving forward for the ARF as an NSF major facility. La uh, one of the, almost to the end here, uh, CITs or CI staffing levels. This, as I mentioned before, is an incredible amount of extra work that needs to be done now, in addition to just keeping things running. 
uh, we have to keep things running in a particular way, uh, and that complicates it. And, and so we're talking about thousands of hours of additional work per vessel that need to be done. Almost every other department on the ship has multiple, has a team of people working and has relief crews. And most of the tech, technical responsibilities for this stuff falls to the marine techs. And we don't have that, most vessels don't have dedicated CI or IT positions. Um, and we're oversubscribing our marine techs. So we need to think about how we're going to staff the support and expertise and skill sets needed uh, to meet these requirements. Um, I guess one other thing I may have missed if I go back, where is it? Yeah, I, I wanna point out that the IMO and ABS assign the responsibility for meeting the cybersecurity plan to the operation side. They specifically want it to be in the SMS. So the accountability and responsibility is on the ops side of the house. Most of the activity right now is happening on the tech side of the house. So that's something we wanna do a better job collaborating on. Um, so what are we asking for from RBOC? What is CIWG asking from RBOC? Uh, we're gonna ask to, that we can get three to five RBOC representatives to participate in regular monthly CIWG meetings on an ongoing basis. Uh, we recommend that everybody read the following, the guidelines on cybersecurity on board ships. It's about a 50 page document. It's a pretty easy read. It's not highly technical. It's, it's a very pragmatic approach to this in, in my estimation. Um, CIWG IMO2 checklist, you can check that out, which summarizes the IMO requirements in the spreadsheet. Uh, so you can see the types of things that you need to be able to say, yes, we're doing that. Uh, similarly for the CMMC level two, if that applies to your institution, uh, please check that level one checklist out. And then if you haven't already read your SMS document, CRMP documents, please find those for your vessel and read through them so you are familiar with the state of them. Um, and then on the inside the guidelines for cybersecurity uh, on board ships on page seven, there's a list of roles and responsibilities. You should assign those roles and responsibilities to positions on your vessels. Um, this is the Annex 2 checklist. Uh, that needs to be done as part of the CRMP. If you haven't done that, please do that. Contact your institution's CISO regarding the SPRS registration and CMM CC 2.0 compliance. So that will impact you if nobody started that conversation at your institution, please reach out. Um, and then we optionally would advise attending the, uh, the Trusted CI Cybersecurity Summit in October. It's an excellent team of people uh, associated with NSF addressing cybersecurity issues at major facilities all over the country. And it's a very good collaborative resource um, to have. So with that, I'm gonna come to an end. I've got a whole bunch of other slides we could go through and talk about if folks are interested, but um, that's the end of this presentation. Okay. Are there any uh, questions for John? I don't see any hands raised. John, thank you. So we have reached the, uh, the end of today's meeting. Um, we are scheduled to start tomorrow, uh, 9 a.m. Alaska time, 10 a.m. West Coast time. And I believe that's uh, 1 p.m. East Coast time. And hey, hey Doug, just quickly, this is Sean Higgins. Um, I had a quick comment on uh, John's thing. I just couldn't unmute myself here. But uh, uh, just a quick, we just had our, our five-year uh, uh, ABS external thing, and, and certainly the cybersecurity uh, part of that was a big part of uh, that conversation and stuff that we had to demonstrate that we'd had uh, not only the things we did with Peregrine and things in place, but also a training program and uh, documentation of a training program on board, uh, differentiating the operational and data networks and stuff, you know, making it clear different training programs for maybe like the sciences coming on board uh, versus like the crew training uh, to kind of talk about it. I mean, Langseth obviously doesn't have much of an operational network being in the age it is, but um, they clearly wanted to see that described and using some of that uh, IMO framework and stuff they wanted to see in that training and stuff. So 
um, certainly a point of emphasis on that. So just something to be aware of because you know, we had to demonstrate both the background networking plan, but also these training programs and documentation and familiarization checklist and so forth as well. Agreed. It's going to be a point of uh, continued uh, focus uh, for these auditing agencies and uh, other groups. So yeah, it's it's something that uh, is definitely worth paying attention to and trying to stay ahead of the curve. Yeah, and it's clear that the auditors don't really quite know what they're looking for yet either, but they're they're getting educated as well as to kind of what they're looking for. So it's uh, but. Uh, yeah, I agree. It's it's going to be a continued point. It's the it's the new thing on their checklist. Yes. All right. Anybody else have a question about cybersecurity, cyber infrastructure, or even about anything that went on today? Oh, I'll just I'll just mention that the the request that uh, John made for people who are on the operations side, the uh, the superintendents that we have. You know, we meet every two weeks for the cyber infrastructure working group. Uh, but one of those weeks, we, we feel like we should, one of those meetings a month, we should dedicate to more of an operational type uh, uh, a discussion because, you know, this stuff isn't the most, you know, intuitive stuff, you know, all these acronyms and all, you know, for some people they did up, but most of us don't really live that way. So, but, it's important and people are gonna get inspected and then you just shrug your shoulders. So I think it's great that what John and the CIWG uh, suggest and that says so some of the superintendents uh, volunteer and once a month you sit through this meeting and, and address operational issues. Let's not forget that. I think that's a very important point. Okay, yeah. Um, so John, you could give me a a schedule for those meetings, I'll make it available for others so that we can join as, as available. Absolutely, we'll get that to you. And Brandy, get your hand up. Yeah, I was just gonna say, um, if anybody wants to be um, on a list or something just for the monthly participation, um, let me know and I can make sure that you are contacted directly and don't miss out. Okay. okay. Anybody else? All right, well, thanks for uh, hanging around, participating, um, listening. Um, a lot of good information today, and we got some more stuff tomorrow. Um, and uh, we're setting aside time for, for meaty discussions tomorrow. So um, let's uh, get some good sleep tonight. All right, I will see you guys tomorrow, and uh, have a good day. Thanks, everyone.